this today to the whole world because we are live from here on what the Lord is saying about the coming of the Messiah. And that is where I want to build on because I laid for you the structure, the program the Lord would want to pass you through. I have not checked your flight tickets. I don't know when your departure is. But I knew that we are doing one week. So, um, and I'm told there are people who might live on Saturday and so forth. So I'm working within this context of uh, five days. But we saw the rapture of the church. And then in the context of the rapture, the coming of the Messiah, I said we would handle what we handled yesterday. Now, the rapture of the dead church and the instruction that is embedded there. And then, after that, we would also handle glorification. I want to be able to have time to handle the glorification of the church, which is a big, big conversation the Lord has had with me. It's a whole message on his own, rather. And uh, uh, the vision of October 18th, the year 2021, as we will see when we get there. And today by voice, today by voice, uh, today by voice, today, the Lord spoke to me by voice and he said, go and by voice, go and speak to the whole world about the glorification of the saints. And so I knew that he really wants me to do this. So I had to to, to, to now weigh between completing uh, the, the resurrection of the dead and uh, starting glorification. So I realized I need to finish what we began yesterday and go into the glorification of the church. And after the glorification of the church, I set out for you again at the introductory, those that were here day one, I set out for you that I would like to advance it to the next conversations. Next conversations, the way we have calibrated them. Hallelujah. After this, the glorification of the church, we have the wooden pulpit, a conversation that really is relevant to you because it's tailored to the priesthood, but also to the church total. Uh, in that very tremendous vision of December 8th, the year 2021, December 8th, the year 2021, when the Lord lowered he made me stand on the left side, the left hand side of the altar, and he lowered for me a wooden pulpit very fast from heaven. And uh, then there is a big conversation there on the replacement of the other pulpit that was there, the glass pulpit. I want to cover that also, because if I don't cover that, I would not be complete at all. I think that is very central and critical because you are the practitioners at the pulpit. So that would be very important because that really is the core of this mission of he that stands here and is speaking with you. That is seated at the very core of my mission to the church. To restore the altar of the Lord and prepare the nations for the coming of the Messiah. Right? And so, so, so we have that. But in between we have more conversations that I have to bring out. So I'm trying to see how to always bring out to enrich and the main theme with all the other conversations that you don't miss a thing, right? Hallelujah. And I know very well that uh, we should also have a day put aside just to meet you, maybe two days, to meet different groups from different countries so that you may be able also to give us some status reports of the church in your countries, the progress on this revival move of God from your respective countries uh, China, you know, uh, you, you told me you have a great report, South Korea and Finland and Italy. And in that way, in those meetings, then we are going to be able to... Um, somebody, can you go and turn on the, this light? There's, there's one light which is not on. Unless these bulbs are dead. Yes, there's one. Don't, don't just switch on and off. Switch, check what that switch does. If you, sw you sw switch back, if it switches off something, you switch it on back. Machere, can you take church? She's going to act like a child over there. I don't have time for this. And walk with her there to teach her so she's not a child. She's a very old woman here. So, um, now, I want us to complete the resurrection we began yesterday. And once we complete it, then I want to move 
L listen to this now. I want to move to glorification. Because they, they seem to be a little tired also. And then I want to move to the restoration of the pulpit. And then after that, I'll bring in all the other conversations and the judgments of the Lord and, and, and all, even the dispensation beyond here and deeper conversations at the throne room of God Almighty if the time will allow. And we need to set time also to meet with different countries. And I'm saying all this with a lot of love, the love of Christ in my heart for you and your nations. Hallelujah. That uh, you may be found ready on that day. And so, yesterday we saw very clearly that in the vision of the rapture of the church, the vision whereby the Lord lifted me up above the earth and then he showed me the earth, I could see the surface of the earth, and then I saw as if an earthquake had hit, a global earthquake had hit the earth, a lot of dust and particles and movement shaking of the surface of the earth and then after that um as i was looking i realized it was not an earthquake because i eventually now saw people in their glorious bodies coming out coming out of uh coming out of that dust and shaking and the soil the movement that was happening people now in their glorious bodies remember dust mixed with glory and then at one point now they went into the pure glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. And as they went into the pure glory of the Lord, they went and united with the Lord. Where the, I could see where the Lord was. The glory of the Lord was there. They went and united with him and they entered into heaven. So we also saw clearly that even me, the Lord is giving me much more understanding and translation and revelation about these conversations. Because now we learned that that conversation of November 25th, the year 2006 at Kehancha, the border of Kenya with, uh, with uh, Tanzania, we compared it. We compared that conversation with the conversation that took place January 15th, the year 2017. Then we realized that again, the Lord in the same manner. So even now, we are seeing so much by design of the Lord, in the same manner lifted me up above the earth and asked me to look at the earth. And then I saw the church when for the first time she left the soil. So only now we are now able to fix the dots. We are able to see in like manner, like design, the first one he was literally talking about the rapture of the dead and the second one the translation of the living. So now I can be able to put it together. It's amazing after many years, right? And so we realize that uh, the Lord is saying that very soon he will take the church. That's the bottom line conversation right there. That very soon there will be the exit of the church from the sin. The taking away of the church from the earth. And that's why you are here. That you may go and announce to your countrymen that now we have met the messengers of Yahweh and they have told us that the Lord has said that very soon he will take away the church from the earth and that the purpose of making that alert, that announcement to your respective nations and populations is that it may now cause them to rethink, to think about their eternity, to rethink their Christian lives to think about how they now want to really live their Christian lives in the context of that announcement. So th this is very powerful uh, that uh, now people may take their salvation more seriously. They may take holiness more seriously. They may take Christian service. I mean serving the Lord more seriously. Reach out, reach out, reach out even more faster now. That's the purpose of this whole announcement that is coming to you at this hour. And I said that if I had time, I would also plow with you the prophetic timeline of God, which begins with the cross, so before the cross, and between the cross and the rapture, then you can see the calendar events, the cross, and then the next calendar event, which is about happening, is the rapture, the next most important. After that, then we have the three and a half years of tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation, and then there is another calendar event, I mean, another demarcation on the prophetic timeline 
which is really the second coming of the Lord. And when he comes, there's a lot of cascade in there. I shared a little bit yesterday, but I would have wanted to share more that I have seen. I have actually seen the Messiah. When First of all, number one, I have touched, I have physically touched the white glorious horse that will come to Jerusalem. I have physically touched him. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have, I have shared with you here. That's something I've shared here. I have shared it already here. I have physically touched the horse and I said his th front legs, are, the thighs are up to up here. He's not a normal horse. He's a huge horse and he's glorious. I've shared that here on day one I shared. And then the, from there you have now that second coming of the Messiah and then you have after that the, 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 there's so much. I have seen also when the Messiah comes and his feet step on the Mount of Olives, the earthquake that takes place, and I saw the ridge that is formed, and uh, when the, if you listen more, the ridge that is formed, and the gate is open, and the glory flows within. The, I saw the glory flowing within that, that ridge. So I have seen these things. They will take place. These things will happen. That's why we need just to be a little bit more careful, but these things will take place. And so, it's important to be more serious now when you're here, very, very serious on this mission. And then after that, we know too well that there's millennial reign of the Messiah. After the millennial reign, then after that, we will have now the white throne judgment. And then you enter into the eternal state. The eternal estate of the Lord. Yes, I know that Wangeshi normally put some water here, not when people are seated, but quite early. So, um, so this is, there's so much wealth in there, conversation the Lord has spoken in there that I would want to share with you people, given the opportunity. But for now, the main hallmark conversations are this we are handling now, the resurrection of the dead, then glorification, then I'll handle the altar of the Lord and see if we have time and do the others. But yesterday we saw very clearly that uh, in the way Daniel describes, the Lord describes in the book of Daniel, the event of the rapture of the dead. So much came out of there. So much. So much wealth came out of there. him that was above the water and we know too well don't tell me you can't walk here with water to me don't you on this side of the river in this side they were talking to him that was standing above the water so i say be very careful that may be a pre-incarnate appearance of christ and that may be a pre-incarnate appearance of christ remember i have met melchizedek i met melchizedek melchizedek that you see appears to abraham in the book of genesis chapter 14 the lord in the beginning of this mission made me meet melchizedek and told me this is melchizedek I have said this, I've preached it, I've given this conversation across the earth, but I'm saying, he that was standing above the water, he lifts up his two hands and he swears. He swears. I mean, he vows by him that sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, that for sure, these things will happen in three and a half years. When he was asked, when will this happen? He stands there. Oh, hey. The TV is doing this again. Randy is not even here today to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So without Randy, nothing ever happens. And so, 
it's amazing that uh, he that is standing above the waters he lifts up both hands and he vows he swears by he that lives forever that is serious that's a very serious event and he swears into a farm that for sure there is a great tribulation coming so I think that is your take home that that time that day will happen that three and a half years will happen and so for you as a church that is yet another moment for which you should make sure that you fight and you don't get involved you don't enter there he he lifts his hands and he does that we saw that but when you read further which i want to open up a little bit for you blessed people with so much joy i say this um if you open up a little open up a little bit the same daniel 12 as we can finish before we go into glorification hopefully today or tomorrow he says the following first of all i told you that if you get time for us it's different because we're involved in this prophetic mission of the lord and uh so we read the books of prophecy but if you have time i said the book of daniel 10 chapter 10 chapter 11 and chapter 12 you could read it together if you have time if you have time if you read together you understand how the lord has aligned that conversation and instruction but in chapter 12 he also spoke here when he said that there are people verse 10 for example he says many will be purified and made spotless and refined but the wicked will continue to be wicked none of the wicked will understand but only those who are wise will understand that that should worry you that is a very serious instruction that again comes out of this conversation because he is literally saying that be careful now that there will be a lineage that in the last days there will be a lineage of those that pursue righteousness those that pursue obedience to god those that follow the gospel and there will be another lineage of those who no matter what you do they have habituated they have chosen that way to love sin and ignore the saving grace of jesus that that should worry you right especially as very especially that you should understand that this playing around with sin in the church that you see happening habituation to sin liking sin making it a lifestyle getting involved in the industry of sin that you see is in the church that should worry you because these people that you see who are wicked he says but the wicked will continue to be wicked that's a lineage of people who obviously you can tell he's saying will enter into the three and a half i mean the entire tribulation seven years of tribulation and these you could say are the beast worshippers it's as though they have already cut out unto themselves their lineage their direction their way that that should worry you as a person and as a church you should be so much worried say wow i don't want to play around with sin because now i'm beginning to understand that there are people who will choose sin and just follow sin 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 until they go and sink in sin that, that is a problem right because yesterday we also saw the gravity the gravity and the reality of hell and realize that hell is not a joke so you want to go and announce this to your countrymen and tell them hell is not a joke my daughter grace who you want to tell them that hell is not a joke so that they avoid going there you want to tell them that the reality of hell is that whosoever enters hell never comes back never comes out and once you tell them that they are wise they will choose against it right that's why you are here hallelujah and so the ones he says are the wicked who, the, who follow the lineage of wickedness let's just look at them a little bit if you don't mind he says the following about them and so i i say they you could call them those that will worship the beast right because in their rebellion you can tell they are going to enter there 
And so, he's saying that the wicked will continue to ignore the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. That's what he's essentially saying there. He's essentially saying that the wicked will continue to ignore the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And so they will not be taken up in the rapture of the church. That is now the tragedy. So, so that is so important for me because you too now, you can actually look at yourself and probe yourself. Focus on me for a moment, everybody. What the Lord is saying there is a big thing. He's saying that there is a lineage of those that will fear God, temor de Dios. In Spanish, will fear God, will love the Lord, will submit under the Lord, will submit and obey the gospel. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, parallel to that, there is another group that will continue to be wicked and disobedient forever. That should worry you. That's a very big thing the Lord is saying. So he's essentially saying that there are those that even when you bring the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah to them, they will ignore it. That is a tremendous thing to hear. Now, focusing on me, everybody, look at this now. Just focus on me. Again, number two, that there are those whom when you bring the prophecy on the coming judgment of God, they will ignore it. That is serious. That's a mucho, mucho serious. That there are people who will deliberately ignore the prophecy that judgment is coming. Are you still focusing on me? As you focus on me, look at this now. In Egypt, there is an atheist, a pagan king. A pagan king in Egypt. And then, when Joseph comes to a pagan king with the prophecy of the Lord and he gives the prophecy of the Lord to a pagan king an idol worshiper pagan, totally pagan it's amazing to me that when Joseph gives the prophecy of Yahweh to a pagan king that is worshipping other things, not a Jehovah worshipper, a pagan king worshipping other things. When Joseph comes and gives him the prophecy of the Lord, that judgment is coming. Seven years of bumper harvest and seven years of total drought and no harvest, no agriculture, no crop. A pagan king is able to believe the prophecy of God. That is tremendous. That is serious. And how? How do you evaluate? How do you get to know that the pagan king has obeyed the prophecy of the Lord? Look at this now. In Portuguese they say mudança mudança of su conducta Cambiamento, very good. The change of his conduct. The Lord is saying that the evidence that you have believed the prophecy of the Lord is the change of your personal conduct that is displayed after you have heard the prophecy. It's not just listening to the prophecy and sitting down. Not at all. Not at all. So this is serious. So this is really speaking right into the heart of the church. In Corazon de Iglesia. Into the heart. How do you call the heart in Chinese? I know we are live. Don't put the camera on me. Yes. How do you call the heart in your language? The heart. Uh, so don't, don't worry. I've asked her. The heart. The, the heart. Look, look, look. The heart. Oops. Thank you, thank you, my daughter. Thank you, my daughter. So, Shen, 
This is serious. He's saying that when a pagan king that is worshipping other things, worshipping idols and what have you, is given the prophecy of the Lord. The change of heart, the change of shin, the change of heart that that king has is the true evidence that that king has believed the prophecy of God. Let me, let me put it better. Let me put it better though. Let me put it another way. That that change of heart which that king displays after the prophecy is given is actually evidenced by a change of conduct. By change of behavior. This is important for the church. Listen to this. This is important for the church. Because he's saying that the, the pagan king has now believed the prophecy of Joseph, prophecy of the Lord, and by believing, then we see the king making changes in Egypt. He builds big silos and stores for cereals, which is demonstrating the whole world that his heart, his heart has believed the prophecy of the Lord. A pagan, a total pagan, his heart has actually believed the prophecy of the Lord. He makes changes. He does things differently after the prophecy. He is doing things differently after the prophecy. As evidence that he has believed the prophecy of the Lord. He does this. He builds big stores. And he begins to instruct people to start growing a lot of crop. And they, they, they eat some but save a certain percentage to be kept in the big stores. He gives that instruction to his people in Egypt as evidence that in his shins, in his heart, he has believed. He has believed the prophecy of God in Sukorazon, in Spaniol, the heart. He has believed. This should be very serious to you. And he appoints Joseph and they begin to collect cereals and they store cereals. Meaning, he has believed that when that time comes, surely there is a famine that will take place there. Are we together? Uh, follow me on this still. Focusing on me still. He's saying, and sure enough, the famine comes. And then he's saying, now he's juxtaposing. He's taking the church that has been worshipping Jehovah and is juxtaposing on this king like this. Then this king outmarches the church. Beats the church hands down. It's amazing. That's why I said let's stop for a moment. Let us stop for a moment and let us have a conversation for a moment please. This is important. I said this is very important. Because the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah has been announced and is still being announced that look all these visions here this is an announcement that the Messiah is coming again there are two I said that the Messiah is coming and he's saying and the wicked continue to be wicked Number two, the prophecy that judgment is coming. You see even, the, the, maybe theophany, I don't know what. That looks like Christ before his incarnation. Standing up there, lifting his two hands and swearing by him that sits up. And he confirms to the earth that sure enough the tribulation is coming and the great tribulation. He confirms by swearing. That judgment is coming. Jugamento viene. Wish of viene in Spanish. Jugamento in Portuguese. He confirms that for true, for sure, that time is coming. But the wicked continue to be wicked. That's why I say it is important that now we juxtapose. We take 
the Egyptian pagan king and then we take the present day church and try to put them together and see now who is going to perform better than the other before the Lord. He's saying that every vision here, every utterance of my mouth has been the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Repent. Repent. Turn away from sin. Be holy. Be ready all the time that when it happens, you don't remain here. You go into glory. That has been the pronouncement of my tongue forever. And he's saying, but when you look at the church, they still remain in sin. I was in Namibia, and apart from the conference in Namibia, the big conference in Namibia, there was a massive healing service. Cripples got up and walked away blind, deaf, what? Chaos, very powerful. But, but before you clap your hands, if you go back to Namibia, Namibia is still in sin in the same position where they were before the announcement came. Did you now understand what the Lord is raising here? This is serious. Very serious. Now you understand what the Lord is raising here. That the king of Egypt, a pagan, he had no Bible to read. He had no miracle to make reference on and build his faith. He had no DVD and YouTube to watch a creeper and build his faith. Not at all. But when he was told that this is what the Lord has said, he believed. And that believing was actually evidenced by the change of conduct. He began to align, alinear, align his life with that prophecy, my Lord. Hi. El comenciar alinear su vida con profecía de Dios. That was such a powerful evidence that the king has actually believed the prophecy. But you go to Namibia and you do a mega healing service and you do a conference there and then when you leave and cripples are still walking up now, the ones who walked on that day and blind and deaf and mute and then today the same country today the same country today is still in the same position unchanged that is amazing that is really amazing actually that is very shocking I how a pagan king I can believe I no and you are Christians the people of God I I've been to Sweden severally with many conferences about six times to Sweden announcing this but when you go back there they are living as though there is no announcement that has taken place it is unbelievable. Hi, that is serious. He's saying, be careful with this habituation of sin in the church. This unnecessary loving of sin going on in the church. There is the building of two lineages. That, that's now the, the warning that's coming from here. This is amazing. This is powerful. Okay, so they, can you just switch off the TV? Switch it off. Yeah, because you can tell it's going off and on. Yes. If Randy does not help you, there's no way you'll make it. Switch it off. So, because he's distracting people. Yeah. He's saying that this loving of sin going on in the lives of the Christians is too deadly. And saying, the people that he says the wicked will continue being wicked. My son from Toronto, it is good to see you. I bless you. It is good to see you. From Toronto, Italy. Powerful healing service there also. But he's saying very clearly here 
that those people they are wicked and they are the people who even if the prophecy came that the messiah is coming they do not obey they ignore number two the prophecy comes that he that was standing above the water has lifted up his hands and he has sworn by swearing that for sure the judgment of God is coming. They still ignore. They ignore the prophecy of hellfire, that there is hell. Are you now starting to understand me properly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you're starting to understand me. This is very serious. They, in other words, are ignoring the prophecy that there is hell coming. For those who don't obey the gospel. That there is hell fire coming, they ignore. This is very serious what the Lord spoke yesterday in the book of Daniel. This, this tremendous prophecy of the rapture of the dead. And we have so much, I'd rather start running. We have so much really. I'd rather start running with this. They ignore, if you're writing, they ignore the prophecy of the coming of hellfire. He says, this, that generation becomes the generation of the great tribulation. That's why I said the worshippers of the beast. Because they are not changing. If you look at the present day church, can I take Kenya as the example? There is such a massive revival going on here cripples are walking blind can see all the evidence has been placed before kenya it is true all the evidence has been placed before them the time is over the messiah is coming but if you go around the country you find people still in other churches where there is no announcement at all going on this is what the lord is talking about here so when you see a very senior president of a Pentecostal Bible College of Italy coming and sitting here, then that is a very big thing. Let us clap to the Lord. That is a very big thing. Why? Because they are simply saying that the announcement has been made. We need to know what the Lord is saying so we can prepare our nation. That when God gives a prophecy, there must always be response. A linear to vida con prophecia de Dios. You must. You cannot ignore. Otherwise, you are the people he's talking about here, the lineage of wickedness. He said, it's a generation of the great tribulation. They are the beast worshippers. It's a generation of blasphemy. They are the unrepentant generation or people or lineage, whichever way you want. That they are the people that will reject God no matter what evidence you present to them. They will just reject God. They are people that love sin and the pleasures of sin. They are people that have accepted the world with its sinfulness. They are people that have made the world, the sinful world, their home. They are comfortable with the world as it is with its sin. There are people that have rejected the grace of Jesus. There are people that reject God's mercy. There are people that have rejected Jesus himself. You reject his grace, you have rejected him. There are people that know very well that God exists. They know very well that God exists. But they reject him. They know very well that God judges sin. Because if you follow them in the tribulation, you hear them saying, Oh, that the rocks may cover us from him who sits on the throne. Meaning they know it is him doing it. It is him judging. But they are not willing to submit. They rather they prefer to go and hide under the rocks than to run to the Lord. Because they ask, the wrath of he that sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb has come, but who can stand? They know very well that only by receiving Jesus can you stand. 
but they still prefer to go and hide under the rocks so those people are not rejecting the lord or they are not wicked because they have not had the gospel they have had the gospel they have been given the privilege to hear the gospel but they reject him he's saying very clearly here they know that god is the one judging and he judges sin but they still continue to reject him there are people that choose sin because they love sin and they are loving sin not because they have no other option or exit but they just love the pleasure of sin oh that is pretty pathetic that's why i'm saying be very careful with this habituation this getting used to sin you see in the church getting used habituation be very careful with this chronic sin in the church and uh, addiction addiction to sin you will you need to check yourself do i love sin that much are there certain sins in my life that i'm not able to clean out i'm not able to take a position strong and say no i want to stop this from today on then you can tell if you're one of those who have habituated on sin who have actually loved sin eternally this is unbelievable he says they choose to sin because they love sin not because they have no option or exit but just because they love sin even though the bible truth has been spoken to them and they are aware that the bible clearly defines the fate and the destiny of sinners they don't care my lord if you reach that level of not caring wow the lord may not help you you have to acknowledge that you are sick for the doctor to help you so this is not what we're dealing with that they are not willing the announcement is on but there are no changes in the country namibia did not change the church went on with its normal activity. Nigeria did not change. They went on their normal activity with their normal churches. Kenya, all over the city here, the other churches just moving on with their normal activity. Uganda, same thing. Except if you go to the altars of the Lord. But the altars of the Lord are not the total country. This prophecy, we are told the entire Egypt changed. The entire Egypt changed from city to city, county to county, town to town, village to village changed. As they, okay, Kenya is very massive now. You cannot ignore it. But there are still a lot of churches doing their own things. They don't have any agenda about the coming of the Messiah. And in fact, they're not even announcing it. They're not even preaching it. As far as they are concerned, I think the Messiah is not even coming back. Otherwise, they would do something about it, right? He says, even though they know the biblical truth that the destiny of sinners is hell, they simply don't care. And when you preach to them about the coming tribulation, he says, it causes their hearts to even harden, Father, my Lord. <laughs> you don't want to be there you don't want to be in the lugar muy peligroso that is very deadly their hearts are hardened father instead of causing their hearts to be repentant be careful with the constant sin you see in the church today let us be careful with that sin so they choose damnation. That's what you could say. They choose that direction. They choose damnation. And yet we know very well that the Lord, he says in Daniel 12 verse 1, he came out very openly. He said there is a difficult time coming. We saw that. Pronounced very severely. Including Israel needing divine intervention. It's that much serious. And so these people in the book of Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13, blessed people, as we finish, we have so much ahead of us here. I will need a, a person to read for me the Bible so we can finish. 
Revelation chapter 12. Just stand up there and start reading the Bible so we can make progress. Really, that's the better way to do. Revelation 13 verse 8. And you are reading very fast today. You are opening your Bible a little faster. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. You read it. The Bible says, The Bible says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So you see, that is what Daniel was talking about. When he said that the wicked will continue being wicked, he was simply referring to them that they will worship the beast. Those ones that refuse to obey the prophecy. Those that refuse to change their ways. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 and then we're going to read verses 10 and uh, 9, 10 there also. The Bible says, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And then go to verse 10 now down from verse 9. Verse 9, the coming of the law lawless, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of display of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that we, all wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Up to verse 12 we're reading. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. And so they said, perish because they refuse to love the truth. And so God sets out, he must judge them. Read on very fast. And so to be saved, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 and 16 in a hurry. Uh, I want to finish with this piece. The Bible says, verse 15, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the, generals, the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the wealthy, the mighty, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Very serious. If you read the book of Revelation, chapter 16, right away, verse 9, and then we we'll read verse 11 and verse 21. The Bible says, they were, they, they, were seared by the in, they were seared by the intense heat, and they cast the name of God, who had control over the plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Verse 11. Verse 11. They refused to repent and glorify him. Can you imagine the amount of heat that comes and burns your back and sears off your flesh? It's very painful, but they still refuse to repent. Be very careful with the present church that is refusing to repent. Be very careful. They are hearing the announcement, but they are refusing to repent. That could just be the generation of beast worshippers. The generation of the tribulation. The great tribulation. Because with all that judgment, they refuse to repent. They steadfastly continue in rebellion. Continue. Verse 11. And cast the God of heaven. Okay, look at what they are doing. They are now turning around trying to cast the God of heaven. Continue. Because of their pains and their souls. Look at that. They are in deep pain. Out of judgment, they know the Lord is the one doing this. But instead of turning to the Lord, asking for mercy, look at, they try to cast the God of heaven. That is unbelievable. Be careful with the habitual sin that is going on in the church. Be very careful. It builds up to something else. Especially after missing the rapture, and then you just take that lineage. Total. Continue. But they refused to repent of what they had done. The bottom line, but they refused to repent. Be careful with the generation that refuses to repent. Be very careful with the generation that refuses to repent. It's very deadly. It's unbelievable. But they refuse to repent. 
Be very, very careful with the generation that refuses to repent. It is not a small thing. Repentance is the only thing when somebody comes preaching repentance, you must all obey. You must all obey. Say, oh, no, no, no. That one is from God now. Because the devil has never sent anybody to tell a sinful generation to repent in Christ Jesus and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Never ever. When someone comes preaching repentance, that one you must always obey. Because that one is from the Lord. But for you to refuse repentance, that is unbelievable. So have you read verse 21 also? Verse 21. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about Are you saying huge pounds. hailstones? You're calling Haley? Can you read it well? From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, fell on people. And they cast God. Look at that. On account of the plague of hail. I, I wanted to go into glorification today. Because the Lord by voice told me. But I said if I don't finish this. I will have done a great disservice to you. To understand the dangers of sin and rebellion. This is important for you to understand. That it is very deadly to be sinful. And to be in rebellion all the time. You finished it? Because the plague was so terrible. So they are irredeemably totally stubborn in their sins. They are irredeemably totally stubborn in their rebellion. Is, that's what I pick from there. And it says here, if you read Revelation 19 verse 20 also, 20 and 21, I think it's 20 where they don't repent again. Revelation 19 verse 20. The Bible says, but the beast was captured and with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs of it on its behalf. Oh yeah, so, so that, they, they, that's their destiny. Matthew 25, 31. Matthew 25, 31, as we move on. The Bible says. And then 41. The Bible says, verse 21. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 41. Just read throughout, up 41. Throughout. In a hurry, we don't have time. Verse 22. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. So you're See? reading Matthew 25, right? Yes, please, my Lord. Okay, please. read verse 41. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed. Okay, so no, th that's the contrast. So now those that believe the prophecy, they are admitted into a kingdom prepared for them by their father, Jehovah Elohim. They are admitted, they are invited to go to that kingdom. And then the ones who perpetually in rebellion, all of a sudden say, These are cursed. That only through the curse can you refuse to obey such a prophecy about the coming of the Lord. It's a very terrible thing the Lord is talking here. Hallelujah. And so now, I want to summarize in the following. The resurrection of Christ was the center of the hope. You remember where we began from? First Thessalonians chapter 4. Those who are here from day 1. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 talking about resurrection talking about dying and resurrecting and we said that that hope they have is centered on the glorious resurrection of christ himself and so that glorious resurrection of christ is what allowed you saw the types of resurrection the types how the bible presents resurrection aaron's budded rod we also read from the book of psalm 23 verse 4 and that resurrection is what instructs the resurrection of all human beings. Are you able to read John chapter 2, 18, 19? In a, I have a lot of scriptures, so you need to move in a hurry. In a hurry. I have a lot of scriptures. I just want to clear them so that we can start on glorification. John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus, I said 18 and 19. Verse 18. The Jews then responded to him. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it 
again in three days. Very serious. And so, resurrection is the greatest miracle of all miracles that ever happened. The resurrection of Christ. That's what he's trying to say there. That is our hope. It's the greatest wonder of all wonders. And he's saying also that there is a specific day that is coming whereby that resurrection will achieve the hope it gave us. There is that particular day. If we get time, we'll be able to reach there. Matthew 6, 16, 21, real fast. We don't have much time. I need to start with glorification. The Bible says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the, on the third day, be raised to life. And um, John twenty seventeen. look at the chronology I'm walking with you. The, Centering the resurrection of Jesus was our hope. John twenty seventeen. Jesus said, do not hold on me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. He has come out of the tomb already. The tomb is now empty. He has come out of the tomb. The tomb is now empty. Do not hold on to me, he says. He has come out of the tomb. I'm walking with you a chronology that you may be able to understand the hope. This tremendous hope we are talking about, right? That is centered on the resurrection of Jesus. You can read Matthew 27, 50 and 51 admitted us Matthew 27 50 51 Matthew 27 very fast the Bible says and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice he gave up his spirit at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom the earth shook the rock split and the tombs broke open the bodies of many holy very people. powerful the body of many people resurrected right yes please my lord okay you are answering me i'm shocked i'll just kick you out can you read we don't have time i'm going to kick you out verse 52 and the tombs broke open the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life they came out of the tombs after Jesus resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to So many admitted people. us admitted us into the holy of holies the curtain ruptured admitted us into the holy of holies the resurrection of Christ very serious that is the hope he was talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 13 and 14 I want to open up on that hope because that hope was foretold in the Old Testament. That hope was the gospel coming. That hope is what the Lord told Abraham in Genesis 12 verse 3. That will be a blessing to all the nations. Hallelujah. Oh yes. I need to finish up with resurrection real fast. So if you can read Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. He's the first born from among the begotten. He's the first begotten from among the dead. Then you see that now. Because of his resurrection, he's the firstborn. He's the first to come out. So even you now, you can resurrect. I really want to run this very fast. Verse 5. Just allow me to run through this because this is a discipleship session. It was not a popular topic or conversation. Because then you have everything when you go. You really have everything with you. Revelation 1, 5, read very fast. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The first begotten from among the dead. He is the first one that came out. And so you'll see that even the resurrection that is promised you, promised the church, promised humanity, is part of his resurrection. Part of that resurrection. We call it the first resurrection. Move on very fast because of my time. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. First Corinthians chapter 6, 14. He says the following. Can you read? The Bible says. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible says. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. And he will raise us. And also. so because of that, even us. Hallelujah. So you are now beginning to understand the tremendous hope that 
Why, why our hope is centered on the glorious resurrection of the Messiah. Our hope is centered there. My daughter Keke, now you have a seat here. I'd reserve two seats. You have a seat there. My daughter Kerubo is sitting here now. Thank you so much. I'd reserve the seat there. Thank you so much. So this is very powerful. He's saying, because of that, even us, we now expect a resurrection. By the same power that resurrected Jesus, he will resurrect us. I mean, I'm talking about you and everybody else, right? Hallelujah. Yes. So he says, Father, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 14, he says. The Bible says. I just want to plow through the bulk of scripture that I just prepared for you. That in that context, when you go to preach, you are now rich in this. And you just preach it. You present it to your people. It will change their lives. Hallelujah. Move on very fast. We are handling the resurrection of Christ. How it touches the resurrection of humanity. Mankind. Move on. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead mm -hmm. will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. That is powerful. And then now, the resurrection of Christ. So look at this now. He's saying, as we saw already, we are simply giving you scriptures to back up that. We saw that the resurrection of Christ is our hope. We who are born again. That is the great hope that... Uh, is laid there in verse 13 and 14, First Thessalonians chapter 4. But then, after seeing how the resurrection of Christ commands resurrection, then now he divides people into two based on that. The whole earth into two. Those who are born again and holy, please you have to add and holy. Born again and holy and righteous. He says, for them, that resurrection of Christ now ordains, ordains a reward for them. Hallelujah. I mentioned it in passing. Can you read it now right away? The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, of course, 13 and 18. We have read, you don't have to read it. The rapture of the church. Because of the resurrection of Christ, now you see a group of people resurrected there and glorified. That's where the foundation of our scripture is. The verses we are handling is 13 and 14. But that is because of resurrection of Christ that now they have that blessing and reward. Hallelujah. And then he says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, read it on verse 10. If you would do verse 8 to 10 would be powerful, but 10 is my target for now. Read but 8 to 10. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That is serious. Because we are sure he has given us a safe passage. Beyond the valley of the terrors and the horrors of death. So we fear no evil anymore. So we can pass through that valley and we know we are sure we are going to make it through the other end. And so that's what, what they are saying there. So therefore you can now stand up and say we have great confidence that it's better to be away from this body and be with the Lord. That's why that statement is being made very powerfully. Read it and finish up to 10. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Verse 10. For, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. But that is very powerful. If you go to verse 8, you can go deeper. Depending on how you want to read the Bible, if you want to get it deeper, you can go deeper with verse 8. Better? Uh, she's not reading. Verse Maybe. 8. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That is serious. If you look, let's look at that statement very deep. To prefer to be away from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That is serious. If you talk about the corruptible body, yes. You prefer to be out of this and then be in the presence of the Lord because forever shall you be with the Lord. Hallelujah. That is very, very serious. Read it again. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That is serious. 
At one point, you need to understand this. Because if you ask every Christian, do you want to die and then later the rapture happens? Or you want the rapture to happen when you're alive to be translated so you go straight? They will always tell you, I want to be alive so I can be translated. They don't want to go through the tombs, right? So that scripture, let me leave that to you to examine that scripture. So he says further on, Revelation 21, 1 and 5, real quick. The rewarding of the Christians, how the resurrection of Christ is the one that ordained, pronounced the rewarding of those who are Christian and holy. The resurrection of Christ. Why? Because we saw that that is the hope. That is the hope we celebrate in the scripture that defines the rapture. He says, no, but you should not weep like that. For us Christians, we don't weep as the world that has no hope. So we are now on that hope. And it's powerful, Revelation 21, verses 1 and 5. You can read 1 and 8 if you want, in a hurry, then I'll open up more things. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The resurrection of Christ is the one that commanded the creation of the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Let's put it this way, better. The glorious resurrection of Christ is that the one that commanded the glorious new heaven, the glorious earth, and the glorious new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Because the reward, the, remember the reward. The hope we have is the reward. The reward for those who are born again so we don't weep like the world. That is what he prepared for us. Can you just read through very fast? For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Coming but that's down. amazing. Are you seeing the bigger picture together? Somebody look at me now. The bigger picture is that the first heaven and first earth they use the word passed away, have died. And now there's a resurrection. There's a new heaven and the new earth have just resurrected. <laughs> Hallelujah. The resurrection of Christ is very powerful. We may never understand it in this age. It's very massive, very muy, muy profundo. We may never understand the extent of the power and the enormidad, the enormity of the resurrection of Christ, but brought into being, commanded the formation of the new heaven, new earth. Read very fast. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, another one that has no sin. Just like now, an eternal body that has no sin, you will also, now he's talking about a new Jerusalem, not the old one, not this one, contested, full of sin and everything, rebellion. A new one now, that is glorious, has no sin, I have seen it. And the Lord by voice said, the eternal home of the righteous. That is serious. That is absolutely serious, blessed people. That is quite serious. Are we together? That is very, very serious. The resurrection of Christ is not a joke. It has commanded serious hope, I mean blessing and reward of that magnitude. And if, he, if she reads, if she reads further, if she's able to read very fast, at one point he says that all this is yours for the inheriting. Can you just read through? Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride be beautifully dressed for her husband. And I but that is amazing. He now changes it. He changes it. Because you are the bride of Christ. But God in his sovereignty Sometimes you are the bridesmaids, Matthew 25, right? So God in his sovereignty is incontestable, indisputable, right? But he's simply trying to come close to us, the condescendence. God takes a condescendence. I don't know that there's a word in Chinese for condescendence. Abuse, abuse, almost an abuse. Yes, like God taking an abuse, God lowering himself. Very good. God takes a condescendence. To take an enormous thing like eternity in heaven and he uses carnal events like a wedding of man but with the purpose of transmitting to make us understand the eternity is too complex we could not understand. So God had to lower himself and use human events to underscore to us some esoteric truths. Some deep truths that we may now understand. Oh, he said like this. 
I saw looking like a rainbow, like light, like, like, como, como. Like a dove, like a huge white dove, como. May not be a dove. Eh? Like an eagle. God takes a condescendence that he may reach our level so that we may understand the enormity of the things of eternity. Hallelujah. Verse, so, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Uh -huh. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. That is the reward you see placed in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 and 14. The hope we have, the hope that should, he is actually saying, should instruct how you live on the earth that hope that should make you live in contradistinction totally different from those unborn again because for you of that hope this tremendous hope of eternal life in the presence of God sinful man a homosexual generation finally washed by the blood and accepted into the glorious family of God this is very serious this is unbelievable. It's like a scandal. It's almost a scandal. Okay, we call it the scandal of the grace, right? It's a scandal because if God was to weigh for you, give you as you have done, it would be thorough judgment, right? You cannot manage it. Hallelujah. And that's why I'm saying today the two of you will be forgiven, right? So, so can, can you move on? They will be his people. They will be his people, meaning he's, he's now ready to do what? To publicly identify with you. What an awesome God. That is now grace proper. He is now willing to publicly. Look at this now. Publicly own you. Own you. Hallelujah. Can you continue? And God himself will be with them. and be Do you now. Can, can I just stop there. Do you understand. The hope he was talking about. In the book of 1 Thessalonians. Those who are here day one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 even those who are not here you can this you know this scripture you know do you now understand the enormity of that hope enormidad de esta esperanza it is muy muy profundo it's very big it's imperceptible in this life it's not easy to understand it in this life you can only take it piece by piece when he said, but for you, you have hope. Why are you crying and weeping bitterly that your sister has died, your mother has died, your brother has died, your husband has died, your wife has died. Why are you weeping hopelessly like that and saying things and throwing your headscarf and saying, what shall I do? Where will I go now? I'm finished now. Oh, Peter, is that really you lying there? What, what, why are you doing that? Why are you mourning like that? He says you shouldn't. He's not telling you to stop mourning. Not at all. But he's saying the funerals of the Christians and those of the non-born again should be totally different. That the funerals of those who are born again and holy at the point of death should literally simply be the celebration of a life well lived. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is what the Lord is saying. And he's saying if you go to the streets and you look at a Christian like in Kenya, for example, where now the economy is tough at this hour, and you walk in the streets, you should be able to see two types of people. You should be able to see the Christians are walking in joy. In joy, why? Because they know that they have hope beyond this life. Hallelujah. That is what the Lord is saying there. But you see now in expanding that scripture, that verses 13 and 14, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you understand now better and deeper that we must now really come out and just be different, walk with hope and focus on that hope. And the Lord is saying that that hope should make you live your life differently, more heavenly focused, now waiting for the Messiah. Are we together? 
I thought that was important. Continue reading uh, uh, Revelation 21. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Why? I don't want to jump the gun here. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Continue. There will be no more death. There will be no more death. Or mourning. Why? Because if we had a chance to go to the book of First Thessalonians chapter 15, where we are going to celebrate the rapture of the church again in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. If you read verses 54 on to 55, you see that Jesus steps forward and pow, finish death. He finished muerte. He stepped forward. It's like he comes into the scene and asks you, who is this that has been disturbing you here? Which one? Is it that one? Then he walks to him and then, pow, finished him today. Oh, yes. He finishes the power of death, the sting of death in 1 Thessalonians 15. And that's why now you see that hope is exuded over there as in there will be no more sin that causes death. There will be no more pain that comes from sin. Sin brought everything. There will be no more mourning that is the result of sin and death. Why? Because Jesus has finished death. Oh, let us do this. Do you remember verse 17, my sons and daughters? Do you remember verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians? Um, yo leo Primera Thessalonians, capítulo 4, versículo 17. Verse 18 says, verse 17 says with Jesus forever, he says the following, verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That we will be with the Lord forever is very serious statement. That should be the benchmark of your Christian salvation. Meaning, nothing will ever separate you from Jesus again. If he goes to heaven, you go with him. If he's coming to, the new, to, to Jerusalem, rather, in the second coming, you come with him. If he's going into the millennial kingdom, you go with him. If he's going into the eternal state, you will go with him. If he's entering the new Jerusalem, you'll enter with him. The new heaven. So that should cause you to really focus on the coming of the Messiah. That is what the Lord is saying here. But if you read verse 18, it's even more powerful. Read verse, verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians. We are talking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Bible says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Wherefore, comfort one, in the other version here, let me pick it here. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Therefore, read it again. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because he has defeated death. So then you know that you are going to defeat death. The day of rapture, the prophecy is saying, wherefore comfort one another with these words. He is referring to this prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And he's saying, people that have this type of prophecy in their hearts, given to them by the Lord by privilege of their salvation, they are living their lives comforted no matter what. They are comforted that one day the Lord is going to take me where? Into heaven. So no matter the circumstances, right? So he's saying, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Because death, that is the day you will defeat death. That is the day you will wear a glorious body. No more pain. No more cancers. No more tumors. Bleeding diseases. And all these things that have bothered you here on this earth, right? No more blindness, crippledness, deafness. So he's saying, we need to focus on this hope. Hallelujah. Continue. He's saying, therefore, comfort. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, comfort one another with these words. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 15 54, 57, real fast, and then I want 58. The Bible says, verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, ah, yes. and the mortal with immortality, yes. then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Now, we know how cruel death is. That is why he was telling you that in verses 14 and 13 and 14, he was telling you that don't mourn as people without hope. He was essentially taking death. Death is cruel. Death is very cruel because death is associated with the fruit, the product of sin. And when people die, it's normally looked at like, oh, we have lost that, we have lost that battle. The enemy has won. That's how it's considered. That's why there is mourning. But he's saying for you people that have this hope of the coming of the Messiah, the rapture, you can literally, you should literally take death and combine it with hope. Death now combined with hope. Those are two polar extremes. Death is totally on this side and hope is on this side. Hallelujah. And so wherefore comfort one another with these words. I need to finish this very fast. Continue. And he says, re read for me the book of Hosea 13, 14. Real quick, it was prophesied already. Hosea 13, 14. The Bible says, Hosea 13, 14. The Bible says, verse 14, I will deliver these people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. That is what he meant. Much earlier, much earlier they had known that Jesus would come and defeat death. This is serious. That's a serious statement I've just given right there. They knew earlier that Jesus would come and defeat death. This now the saints of the Old Testament. They knew earlier. That is serious, right? And then when you go, of course we read yesterday Job chapter 19, 25, 27. We read that. Can you just read it? I don't even have it here, but read it. The Bible says, Job chapter 19, verse, ver uh -huh. verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Let, let me give a chance to the other languages to read. Hosea, uh, we are reading, we are, we are reading uh, Job chapter 19 verses uh, uh, 25 al 27. Verses 25 to 27. The Bible says... Hold it, hold it. He's reading. The other languages. In Chinese. Very serious. Already foretold that death would be defeated. But what, what is this that we are being told now you should combine hope with the book of Psalm 55 verses 4 to 6. Psalm 55 verse 4 to 6. The Bible says the Bible says Psalms chapter 55 verses 4 and 6. My heart is in anguish My in me. heart is in anguish in me the terrors of death have fallen on me. The terrorism of death has entered me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Fear and trembling have consumed me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Horror has now defeated me, overwhelmed me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Up to verse 6, you're finished. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. Oh, that I should get the wings of the rapture, the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. That I may be raptured and fly away in the clouds and never ever be here again and experience the horrors, the terrors that are being described there, characterized with death. Okay, so very serious right there. And that's why he's telling you that you should now be joyful because you have defeated that. The Lord essentially has given you the wings with which to fly. I don't know why their garments had this connection here. But I'm just saying that on the day of rapture, the spirit of the Lord will lift you away. Out of all this. Yeah. You'll never have to suffer this again. That's why he said, wherefore comfort yourselves one another with these words. That is the hope 
of first thessalonians chapter 13 first thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 that is the hope. He said, no, for us we cannot wail like that. Oh, Peter, you have left me like that. You are now lying there. Is that really you, Peter? Oh, what shall I do? Throwing the headscarf and doing things. He says, you cannot do that. You, you have hope. You cannot wail like those people, right? You simply celebrate a life well lived, if they lived it well, right? And so, continue then. He's saying, uh, John, I think John 16, 33, I'm going to a place where you cannot, no, the world, this world will give you trouble. John 16, 33. The Bible says, verse 33. We don't have time, I'm running. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. Mm -hmm. In this world you will have trouble. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you don't read very fast, I will cut you. You have to read and finish every scripture. 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 and 5. The Bible says because I, I want to start on, and, on, on glorification. The Bible says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Again, Christ. Again 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 3 and 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Very good. And then read for me Isaiah 66, 24. Isaiah 66, versículo 24, por favor. The Bible says, verse 24, And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. Very serious. And then now, read Luke 16, the reality of it. Luke 16, 19 to 31. The Bible says, There was a rich man that was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat that what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In heads, first of all, what you, First of all, what you see there is that everybody has to die. Everybody must die. Unless the rapture happens when you are awake, alive, and you are part of the generation that don't taste death. You are translated. Otherwise, everybody has to die. So you have to do something about it, right? That's the first thing. Just move on very fast. 23. In Hades, where he was in torment. In Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Agony, torment and agony. Verse 25, the, but Abraham replied. Thank you so much. So you see the characterization of death and torment and terror and horrors of death. And he's saying that is what the first resurrection of Christ wiped away for us. And it was given earlier in the Old Testament. It was given that he would come and do it. And let's just read a few statements in the New Testament before we do that. Second um, Timothy chapter 1, 9 and 10. Secunde Timotheo, capítulo 1, versículo 9 y 10. Verse 1. Again, Second Timothy chapter 1, 9 and 10. Verse 9, the Bible says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Verse 10, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and eternity. Very humanity. powerful. He has destroyed death, but that grace was given earlier before time that hope that's why i said if i had time to go through that hope that's why you see he celebrates that hope he said oh let, let, let me say this he celebrates in titus chapter 2 but look at this now 
In Titus chapter 2, as he celebrates that hope, he talks about this waiting process, waiting for our blessed hope. He calls it the blessed hope. The rapture of the church. And that waiting is not a passive process. If I have time, I'll read Luke chapter 12, 35, 40, and then you'll see that that waiting is characterized by the following. The instructing of your soul to avoid everything ungodly, everything worldly, and sinful desires of the flesh. And then to accept everything godly, holy, obedience unto God. The, the gospel is self-sufficient to train you and coach you on righteousness. This thing the church is doing today is evil and it's a lie. They are pretending or they are behaving as though the grace of Jesus, the grace of God, no tiene poder suficiente para liberar ellos. No. They are behaving as if Evangelio, the gospel of Jesus, no tiene poder suficiente. Does not have enough power to deliver them. That is a lie. When you read Titus chapter 2, I think let's just read all of it. Then you see that the grace of God has power both to instruct you and be sensitive to wickedness and also to instruct you to choose holiness, reject sin and evil, and then to accept righteousness and holiness. The grace of Jesus. Hallelujah. And so, in 2 Timothy, as we've read, you see, he's saying right away, the grace of Jesus that was promised earlier, that is the hope he's talking about, was promised earlier, is what brought the hope of Jesus extinguished, exterminating death in your life. Materialized on the day of rapture, right? When you're being lifted up, when you have def defeated death. Okay, so we don't have much time, we need to run. And he's saying, the, the, the rich man is in torment. We have seen in Psalm 55, the horrors, the terrors of death. Death is terrible. One characteristic of life on this earth is death. Death is terrible. Let us read Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Please read it. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Real fast because it's not even in the rudder, my rudder. The Bible says, verse 27, just as people are destined to die once mm -hmm. and after that to face judgment. You see that now. And then verse 28 on how to wait for Christ. But the people is coming to take. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting to for him. To those who are waiting for him. And he's not coming to die again because I have seen him. I have met the Lord. He has a crown. So he's not coming to argue with the Pharisees anymore and get tired and cross by foot towards Bethany again. No. He's not. He's coming to take his own. Because he already died for the church. And when he died for the church, he paid with his own blood. When he paid with his own blood, then he developed a covenant with her. When he developed a covenant with his people, the church, then he separated them. And then he told them that now he's going up there to prepare a place for them. You also prepare the earth. So he's coming back to take those who are waiting for him. And he has every right to take the church. Because he has paid with his own life. And so, therefore, he has the right to get a befitting church. A befitting bride. A holy bride. Because of the tremendous excellence of the work he did at Calvary. Perfectamente. He did everything perfectly. And he delivered us completely. So the church is lying that he did an imperfect job that he's not able to deliver them totally. The church is lying today. Jesus did a complete job, sufficient power he left behind for total deliverance, total liberation. So we rather leave the full deliverance of salvation, blessed people. Read real fast, I don't have time. It was foretold in the book of Isaiah 25 verse 8. The Isaiah 25 verse 8, por favor. The Bible says, He will swallow up death forever. Oh, yes. The sovereign Lord 
will wipe away the tears from all faces. That is serious, blessed people. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 26. I'm running. Just write the scriptures. I will explain everything together. I'm going to explain everything together. But you are catching what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 24, 26. The Bible says, verse 24. Then the end will come when he, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is, is death. death. So when you get a chance to read Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 to 15, then you see finally he, ex he, he finally extinguishes death on that day. Even death is judged. Hallelujah. That is just how mighty the God we serve Jesus Christ is. So therefore we need to live totally different from the world. We need to live with hope. I'm just running through this because I want to cover everything for you. And so, now, for that matter, if you have that amount of hope, now turn with me now to the book of Hebrews chapter, I'm going to read it myself here. Hebrews chapter 11, turn with me there now. I'm now reading. Machari, you can retire whoever was reading there. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, everybody are with me now? Now, in the Old Testament, they simply heard that the Messiah would come and would exterminate death. Eyo solamente escuchor. Eyo no viste. They did not see it. They did not realize it. Let's read. I'm going to expand it, but let's begin from verse 35. Hebrews 11:35, if you can. 35 of favor. If you want, you can read from 32 if you want. From 32 he says, "And what more shall I say?" Hebrews onset from 32 al 40 of favor. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 32 to 40 says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon. He's not saying, look at this now. He's not saying the Bible, I do not have enough examples. He's saying, if I began to narrate them, what this promise of resurrection did to people that are examples, are powers in the Bible. I would do it forever. There would be no space. He's saying the problem is time. But the Bible is full of them. He says, I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, again, Jephthah, uh, about David and Samuel and then at the end <laughs> at the end he just ends like this he ends quietly in a manner that seems simple he says and the prophets those are now the icons of what he wants to talk about here but he, you know, simply like that those are now the pillars of what he wants to discuss here the prophets of Yahweh and it goes on to say, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms and administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. Hallelujah. We are beginning to understand each other, right? Who shut the mouths of lions and quenched the fury of fiery flames? In other words, inside the furnaces. I think you're beginning now to have a conversation with me. We are now beginning to talk. Who through faith, again, if I were you and I meet faith, you, if you want to highlight it, you highlight it. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, 
and quench the fury and the fiery furies of flames and escape the age of sword of the sword whose weakness was turned around to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies 35 where we were supposed to begin says women received back their dead raised to life through resurrection there were others who were tortured refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection this is serious let me even end right there for a moment moment of favor he's saying that you are the church of christ you are the generation that are living you have realized christ salvation he has come and gone to the cross you are born again the holy spirit has come hallelujah you can see the evidence also of his power creepers are walking the blind can see the deaf can hear so you're really living in that dispensation when christ has come and we have just celebrated the power of his resurrection but he's saying that the saints of the Old Testament, Santos the Antigua Testament, they did not see Christ. They only listened to the prophets. Solamente escuchor profetas de Dios. And they heard that the Messiah would come and that when the Messiah would come he would come with power to extinguish the power of death that he would come with sufficient power he would go to the cross and he would come from there with power to exterminate death Solomon they simply heard and he's saying that when they heard that they captured it are we still together my daughter from South Africa when they heard from afar in the Old Testament they captured it in Spanish they say Eos Tomar they took it When they captured it, it was so treasured to them that it now fortified their faith. From afar, just hearing that the Messiah would come from the prophets walking and saying that the Messiah would come, there was no Bible. Just hearing that the Messiah would come and you would exterminate death. When they heard that, they it built their faith on God. It fortified and strengthened their faith to the extent that he mentions in 35, look at what he says in 35. <laughs> in 35, he says, he says, Women received back their dead, the works of the prophets, raised to life. There were others who were, number one, tortured. Have you heard the word tortured? Do you know what tortured, tortured means? Tortured essentially means describing the manner, okay, okay, describing the manner in which he was beaten until he died. So if it is a piece of metal with a swollen head of the metal, they hit the head. Pa! 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 
and killed. That is the meaning of torture. He's saying that when they simply heard that the Messiah would come, would come, they have not seen him come. Then he strengthened their faith and look at what he did to their faith. Whereby when persecution came, look at what happened, 35, women received back their dead raised from, to, to, to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Focus on me now. He's saying big what this is big. This is the hope he was saying should make the church today live totally different from the rest of the world. This hope here. He's saying this is so big we should be glowing when we are walking out there. Because he's saying that the saints of the Old Testament by mere hearing that they did not see they just heard that the Messiah would come. And that the Messiah would, when he comes, he would come with sufficient power and authority. Sufficient. Paramatam muerte. For killing death. And when they heard that the Messiah would come and exterminate death and the sting of death, the victory of death would be taken away from death. It fortified their faith. And they began now to live for God. Ayos commenced, I don't know why Elizabeth always looks as if she's trying to peep at me. I don't know why she does that kind of nonsense here. So, it is unbelievable because it fortified their faiths to the extent that now they resolve to live for God alone. Step by step. And then he says, that because of that, persecution came. But when persecution came, they refused to renounce their faith. And they accepted when they were told, please renounce your faith. If you renounce it, we will release you. They refused to be released and accepted to be tortured to death. Why? Because they simply heard that the Messiah will one day come in a generation ahead there and will die for us and then he would give us a better resurrection. Let me explain this to you. Let me explain better resurrection to you. Let me explain this. He's saying that resurrections took place by the prophets of the Lord. Resurrection. And he's saying, but when the Messiah would come, a day would come, okay, I am surpassing Lazarus. If you noted, I've surpassed him when I say a day would come. If you just noted, I've already passed Lazarus. Have you noticed? I have passed him. They were told, that when the Messiah comes, a day would come, a day. When the Messiah finally would resurrect people. And he would resurrect people, both of the New Testament church and the Old Testament saints. And that resurrection would be much better than all the resurrections they have had. Are you hearing me now? Just a moment. Would be much better. Why? Because that resurrection would not be like the resurrection of Lazarus. When he was resurrected, he still died. That resurrection would be a superior resurrection whereby when now the Messiah would resurrect people on that day that is coming, they would be glorified and be given eternal
eternal bodies, glorious bodies, and they would enter the eternal kingdom of God. Do you understand me? When they heard that piece of hope, good news, became their hope. When they heard that good news, that became their biggest hope now. Wow. They said, wow. The Messiah is going to come and do that. That is it. Now we are going to live for the Lord. We are going to live for that Jesus who is coming. Orita agora in Portuguese. Orita nosotros te vivir por él. For that matter, we will now live for him. And he strengthened their faith. And that's why when they were being tortured and being told to renounce their faith, they refused to renounce their faith. They said, you just kill me because I know that nobody will live on the earth forever. Even if I accept to renounce my faith today, I will still die. But you rather kill me now. So I go into glory on that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh yes. This is serious. This is very serious. The present day church has attempted to abuse Jesus. The present day church attempted abusar Jesus. They have attempted to abuse Jesus. Can you sit down? They have attempted to abuse Jesus. Because they had not seen the coming of the Messiah. They only heard from the prophets who were walking around. And at that time, it was not even a time of putting people together like this. You just go to the market door, you say it, you move out. You say it to another two people, you move out. You walk to a village, say it, move out. They heard that the Messiah would come. And the Messiah would come with a lot of power. And he was bringing power to kill death. In other words, resurrection power. And once they heard that the Messiah had guaranteed, when he comes, he would guarantee resurrection power and that they would be resurrected on that day, that day that, look, he's saying a better resurrection, meaning the resurrection of that day would be totally different from all these other resurrections where people are resurrected and they die. No. That they would be resurrected in other words, glorification. That they would be glorified. He's saying, when they had that hope, no, 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 no. They were not in the New Testament church. They did not see the advent of these two prophets calling rain from heaven, calling the cloud of God to, to express to you that now that day is near. Not at all. They, they had not even seen Christ has not gone to the cross. But when they just heard that he would come and go to the cross, it fortified their faith. You see, I'm, I'm talking on faith. I keep talking, saying faith. Fortified their faith and strengthened their faith such that their faith was immovable. Not movable. When they heard that. Their faith could not be moved. And he's saying, because of that promise of resurrection on the day of rapture and glorification, look what happened. They accepted to be tortured to death. They began to live for Christ. Look at this now. They have not seen Christ come, not yet. They have not lived salvation, not yet. But look at this now. He's saying, because of that, that promise, he said, verse 35 again, he says, there were others who were tortured, refusing to renounce, re refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Why? They understood that everybody must one day die. That you can renounce Jesus, Today, 
and live for a short while for a temporary pleasure. A short while on the earth here. And then, your day of dying will come. Because everybody must die. And when you die, you would go to hell. Because you renounced Jesus. So they refused to renounce Jesus. Because they understood that the Messiah would come with resurrection power. Look at this now. For that matter, they were tortured. He's listing them down now. Some were tortured, refusing to be released that they might gain an even better resurrection. In other words, he's saying people that have this hope just by hearing them, they just heard this hope of resurrection, of rapture. The, the hope I'm always describing here that I've seen the church go and enter. I've seen the church taken and enter. That people that have that hope Whether you torture them, they will not renounce their faith, my daughter, Mrs. Lumala. They will not renounce their faith. And he's saying, they refused to be released. Some faced jeers. So if you are listing, you listed tortured. Number two, jeered. And flogging, number three. And even chains, number four. Being chained. And he says, and imprisonment, being put in prison, number five, six. Hmm? Number seven, they were put to death by stoning. They were sword with a soul like this in two pieces. How painful it is to be sown. They were sown with a, with a soul in two pieces. Huh? This is serious. And then he says, they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins. Is somebody following me now? They went about wearing sheepskins and goatskins. They were destitute, meaning you have nothing. You have nowhere to stay. So, so look, oh, look at me. Look at me now. What is he saying? He's saying that because of hearing that the Messiah would come, just hearing that the Messiah would come, their faith was so strengthened and they had strong faith in the Lord and because of that, they began to face persecution. And when they faced persecution, it was so bad that some of them were dispossessed. Some of them were dispossessed. Their relatives rejected them. Some of them, they lost their things. They lost their homes. So they became destitute without where to stay. But never to renounce the faith. They accepted to lose home. Like your home where you stay in Italy or in South Korea. Someone, this, because of that, they throw you out. And they say, if you renounce, Jesus will give you back your home. They refused to renounce Jesus. They chose to be destituted in this life. To be homeless. Better language that is known in Kenya. To be a homeless. They accepted to lose their home. They accepted to be tortured to be killed, my Lord. To be killed. When they heard in the Old Testament that the Messiah would, would, would come. The word is would, would come. He has not yet come. And he's saying, some where they faced jeers, flogging, and even chains, and imprisoned. They were put to death by stoning. They were sold with a saw into two pieces. And they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitutes, persecuted, and mistreated. Verse 38. The world was not worthy of them. That when they heard that the Messiah would come. When they just heard that the Messiah would come. 
when they heard that he would bring resurrection power then they realized that that thing the messiah is going to bring resurrection and glorification is the most treasured thing ever created and they said for that they now accepted let's read it again they accepted he said he said yeah they were killed by the sword they went about in sheepskins and goatskins destituted persecuted and mistreated then they said look at me that if it is true the messiah is coming to finish death and to glorify us and take us into the kingdom of glory then for sure this world is not worthy of us oh yes they rubbish the world on that day they said for that matter this world is not worthy our lives listen to this very carefully because iglesia aurita in espanol iglesia agora in portuguese the church right now is actually pursuing the things of the world right now is pursuing the things of the world in uganda is terrible it's unbelievable in kenya it's terrible everywhere south korea where the church is right now clamoring to get the things of the world and yet for them by mere hearing they have not seen christ come yet when they heard that he would come and defeat death and glorify them and bring them into glory on the day of rapture they declared from that day on that the world is rubbish that the world with its wealth is rubbish is not worthy of their faith is not worthy of their lives is not worthy of their hearts they declared this is serious and then now you have a generation where the messiah has already come uh -huh. now you have a generation where the messiah has already come he has come and he has already gone to the cross and you have already lived the salvation you are born again and you have experienced the power of that salvation of the cross and the blood creepers are walking yesterday blind eyed opened in china You have experienced that power. You have experienced that power. And then you are still busy fighting for the things of the earth and not ready to renounce the world. Not ready to renounce the world. Instead ready to renounce the faith. Do you understand? Do you now understand the vision of the rapture of the dead? The promise of resurrection on that day, that particular day. He's saying, that is your hope. Verses 13, 14. That is the game changer that should have changed everything in your life, how you live on this earth. Because he's saying, they accepted to lose property. They accepted to lose everything plus their lives. And they're saying God's skin and everything. Look at what he says, Father. He says, verse 38. The world was not worthy of them. They were wandering. They wandered in deserts like animals. Meaning, these are people who were even excommunicated from their communities. Excommunicated from their families. But refute, renounce Jesus. My Lord. This is serious. Huh? They wandered in deserts. 
and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. You now tell me, who of you is ready to enter into a hole with a blanket and say that is how you are going to be living your life? You talk to me. Who of you is now ready to go and live in a cave or in an underground hole? You say, no, there is a python there, it might bite me. They entered inside caves without a blanket. They chose to continue living for Christ. They accepted to be excommunicated by their families and their communities and dispossessed. But never ever to lose faith. Why? Because when they heard the Messiah would come and on a particular day bring about a better resurrection, glorification, a rapture for entry into heaven. The vision I describe here, it fortified their faith. You could not other than kill them. You could not change their faith. You must kill them. You must kill them. But they will not renounce Jesus. Hi. Do you see what an indictment on this church? And he's saying, verse 39, these were all commanded for faith. In the other versions, does somebody have, uh, I don't have King James here. Does somebody have King James here? Read it aloud. Shout with the microphone they're given to you at the back there. Read verse 39. I'm reading this verse in King James deliberately. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 39 King James version and this all having obtained a good report through faith having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise received not the promise continue Go, verse 40 God having provided some better thing for us look at that God here he says since God had planned something better for us continue that they without us should not be made perfect. Anybody with another version? Because I want to open for you. Again, just read 39 there. 39 again. Read 39. Their approval by God. 39 says. I read mine first. He says, they were all commanded for their faith. Commanded. The word is commendation. Commanded. There is another one called divine approval. Another one. And this all having obtained a good report. A good report. Another version. Now look at this now. Having done that, they receive divine approval from God. That is a problem. Because the present day church is seeking for approval from the world. Oh yes. The present day modern church is instead seeking approval from the world. But for them, they rejected the world eh, that they may receive divine approval from the Lord. Why? Because they heard that there is a day the Messiah would come and present a better resurrection, glorification, at rapture, eternal body for entry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Este agora de cambiamento, mudança in Portuguese. This is the hour for changes in the church. We must bring changes to the church of Christ. Because right now it's the opposite. They are seeking approval of the world, not the divine approval of Yahweh. But these people when they merely heard that the Messiah would come, just hearing, they accepted to suffer, persecuted, dispossessed, destituted, tortured, abused, persecuted, everything happened to them, thrown out, entered caves. They accepted to go to the mountain and live in caves. Why? As long as I get divine approval from the Lord, my Lord. The message 
of resurrection at rapture. The message of resurrection at rapture. My Lord. Serious. I wanted to go straight to glorification. But I said no. I need to finish this. This is important. He's saying. Look at this now. That the resurrection of Christ. The glorious resurrection of Christ. Is what commanded resurrection for all. But among all that are resurrected, he now divided out those that are resurrected for eternal life. The one I saw. For reward. Reward. To be rewarded. Recompensed. And another group resurrected for what? Damnation. Judgment. Commanded by the resurrection of Christ. And he's saying, that the promise of resurrection or glorification, the better resurrection where you are resurrected once for all, never die again, should fortify and strengthen your faith so much more than the saints of the Old Testament. Nuestro Señor espera. He thought, el piense, that esta generación would live a more powerful salvation. Why? Because they have realized Christ has gone to the cross. Christ has brought salvation. Christ has brought the Holy Spirit. He expected much better than the Old Testament. But instead, now if you look at the church in the Old Testament and you compare with this one, it's unbelievable. It's, a, in an, in an, it's not believable. Eh? It is not believable that this age can live in the dispensation when Christ has come and gone to the cross and died on the cross and buried resurrected and ascended sent the Holy Spirit. And the announcement of that special day is now happening. It is totally unbelievable to the Lord that even until now, this church cannot reach the level of the Old Testament saints who simply heard Solamente Escuchor. Aye. That's why you are here. That you may go bring repentance to your nations. This calls for global repentance, national repentance. A whole generation should repent. Now let me read further the things he says here. And he says, verse 39, These were all commanded by faith, divine approval, yet none of them received what had been promised. Eos gloriosos. That glorious the church, I want to call it church. The Old Testament saints with their glory. How glorious their faith is. He's saying they have not yet received the reward due them. Why? Because he's saying, again, they are yet, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect? To be made perfect is essentially glorified glorification. To be made perfect refers to glorification. He's saying that they have not yet received their recompense, recompensa, in the glorious nature in which they walked with their faith and with God. In that glorious way in which they walked with faith and with God. He's saying until now, God did not reward them. God knew that another generation was coming that would realize the cross. And realize salvation. 
and realize visitation of the Holy Spirit and realize the cloud of God going down to them. Realize the rain of Mount Carmel pouring on them and they are dancing in the rain. And realize leprosy cleansed. Realize blind eyes, 100% 100% healed in Rio de Janeiro. And realize the latter glory. That that generation would be more glorious supposedly than them. So he did not reward the glorious Old Testament saints that walked in a manner maravilloso, excellent. He did not reward them yet. He was waiting for this church. He was waiting for this homosexual church. He did not know. He did not expect that this church of this age would receive the salvation of the cross, salvation of the blood, the visitation of Holy Spirit, and also the announcement of the coming of the Messiah, the wonders of God, and then go ahead and still become homosexual. He held back the award ceremony to recompense the Santos, the Antigua Testament, Santos Gloriosos, the Antigua Testament, the glorious saints of the Old Testament. He held back the rewarding of them. He says, no, I have a superior team coming. I have those that will now have a superior faith. That the moment they will realize that the hour, the rapture is coming, their faith will be much more superior. But instead, what have you found? They became homosexual generation. They became a church that accepted homosexuality. They became a church that accepted abortions. This generation became a church that accepted the nudity of women and open prostitution in the church. Open prostitution. Where men come to pick women. Did you now understand why you're here? You must go back home and bring repentance. You must go back to your countries and call for national repentance. Tell them, no, we have not done well. We need to repent and now begin to walk with a fortified faith because we have even heard the announcement of the coming of the Messiah. Our faith should have been stronger and more fortified and more powerful and more glorious than the faith of the Old Testament saints. The message of the rapture of the dead church came in such lindo, came in such puro. What a powerful message! What a pure message that this generation has to now wake up and live to the reality of the expectations of the investment the Lord has laid on them. Are we together now? Oh, yes. That's why I wanted to finish with the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. Let me just finish a few things here and then we'll get started with glorification. But we have seen very clearly that resurrection of Christ is what brought us justification, was defeated death, and is what will unite us with Christ. The pitfalls, the casual Christian living of today. What makes the present day church fail to realize that is the casual Christian life today. Unbelievable. Matthew 24, 37. Read it for them. Thank you for serving the Lord. Matthew 24, 37, 38. Matthew 24, uh, versículo 37 y 38. The Bible says, Verse 27. Biblia dice. Matthew 24, 
For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even okay, Matthew 24, 37, 38. 37, the Bible says uh, in a hurry. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Messiah. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in, in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. A casual Christian life, normal, usual life. The dangers of that. Revelation 3, 15, 16. The Bible says, verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Read it very fast. We have a lot of work. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. Living a casual, a normal Christian life is too deadly at this hour. I, I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say in, in Dutch, they say to vomit you out. I will vomit you out in German, in Dutch. I'll vo I'm about to vomit you. I'm about to spit you out. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Living a casual Christian life when the Lord has called you to a higher bar, a nobler calling, a nobler life, a heavenly life, a higher calling. The book of Matthew 7, 21, 23. Not everyone who calls on me, Lord, Lord. The Bible says, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. The dangers of a casual Christian life, a usual Christian life, has caused the present generation of church to fail to realize the power of the promise of glorification. The power of the promise of a better resurrection. The power of the promise of the coming of the Messiah. The power of the promise of a new heaven. And the new earth. And the new Jerusalem. Nobody ever promises people that. No. Only the Lord our God does. And that's a big thing. That he can promise you eternity in glory. It's very big. It says the following. Luke chapter 9, 24, 25. The Bible says, verse 24. Make sure you mention Luke. I will kick you out. Luke chapter 9, 24, 25. You mentioned full scripture so they know what you're reading. Luke chapter 9, verse 24 to 25. The Bible says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? There you go. In the process of gaining the world, the Old Testament saints that are glorious before the Lord, they lost the world, they lost their homes, they even lost their families. But this church has changed the gospel. They have changed the original gospel of Jesus that they are preaching another. The original gospel of Jesus did not promise false hopes. This generation have promised them false hope. So they come and live another life. The original gospel of Jesus says the following. Whoever wants to be my follower must hate his wife, hate his husband, hate his children, hate his family. The original gospel of Jesus. Tomorrow we will, maybe after tomorrow, I hope tomorrow, we'll handle that when I handle the pulpit. He says, examine yourself. Second Corinthians 13.5 Wherefore, examine one another to check if you are, to see if you are still in faith. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 
The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do, not, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So now, this generation must test themselves. Because if the Old Testament saints that did not see the coming of the Messiah to go to the cross, if they can live a more glorious life like that, and this generation, the church falls below, then you have to examine yourself if you're still in the right faith. Yesterday I said that this generation is a, a, a new Jesus, a modern Jesus has walked into the church. And that modern Jesus is right now in, in there and they are worshipping him. And that modern Jesus is very sweet talking. That modern Jesus is very understanding. He understands. Even sin he will understand. There is a modern Jesus in the church today. And he has brought forth a modern salvation. Whereby the grace of Jesus is like a license for sin. License for sinning. Permission to sin. And I say that the modern Jesus that they are now preaching in the church is one who as though he will understand. He will understand. Don't beat yourself too hard with it. He will understand. And so, as though he accommodates sin, he's accommodative. This generation have allowed a modern Jesus to walk into the church and sit there. A Jesus who is not judgmental, no, he, he does not judge. He will not judge sin. And yet we know very well that when I saw the Lord, when the Lord appeared to me in the sky, on the right hand side of the sky and walked across, he had a crown and he had a golden sash around his chest and a red robe. And that red robe represents the events you see in Isaiah 63, 1-5 when he's coming from Bosra and he has crushed his enemies. He has judged them. He has pressed the wine press and they have spattered on his garment. That red robe is the one you see in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. When he's coming with a sword to judge. The Jesus we worship, he judges sin. He is holy. He died on the cross to take the judgment of God on sin. That is how severe it is. But this generation, Ugando con pecado, they are playing around with sin. Bringando con pecado. And so, John chapter 8, begin reading 21, 24. John chapter 8, verse 21 to 24. The Bible says, John chapter 8, verses 21 to 24. The Bible says, once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. You will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. 22, these made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are my make sure you mention the verses so they, they are different languages going verse 23 but he continued you are from below i am from above you are of this world nuestra jesucristo nuestra salvador is from above our lord jesus is from above his gospel is from above his salvation is from above the Christianity brought us is from above. But right now, there is another gospel that is from below. That is connecting this generation of Christians to the earth. And the wealth of the earth. 
wealth and health, the more supposedly the better. He's saying he's from above. And the devil is from below. Continue verse 24. Verse 24. I Listen to that. Listen to verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins. I told you you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So, he's saying there are two types of death. Revelation chapter 14 verse 13 he says, the I am reading Revelation 14 13 he says, Apocalypse 14 3 and he says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this. Remember John has been writing, right? If you go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 he was told to write. Revelation 21 verse 5 he is told to write. And now he's being told, write this. Apocalypse 1, 19, write this. Apocalypse 21, 5, write this. Akita Bien, write this. Meaning this is now serious. This is now getting serious. This is too serious. He said, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. He's saying there are two types of death. He said there, I warned you that you die in your sins. He said there, I warned you that if you don't repent, you would die in your sins. And he's saying that there's another death here where now you die in the Lord. And he's saying there are only two types of death. Either you die in the Lord or you die in your sins. And he's saying the two are polar differences he's saying that the devil has lied to this generation and trivialized eternity trivializer has trivialized eternity ah don't worry it's not that serious and yet he's saying Eternity is not a joke. There are only two types of death. He said, I warned you that you die in your sins if you don't repent. And yet he said, blessed are those who die in the Lord. There are only two types of death. And he's saying that, oh my, you should realize what the stark difference is. You would never play with sin. That if for any reason you make a mistake and die with your sins, oh my Lord, it is finished. It would be unbelievable. We read yesterday what happens in hell. And it happens eternally. Eternally there is no coming out. Hi. And he's saying that far. And then this other end that is dying in the Lord. And he's saying that punishment, judgment against sin, Jesus carried it all on the cross for you. On the cross for you. And he took the judgment that you were supposed to take on the cross. All, all the sins of all men plus those not yet born. On the cross. Jesus carried the sins of all men. Such that if you die in the Lord, holy and repentant and born again proper, you, 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 walk, you walk through that door of death like this. <laughs> Revelation chapter 9, verse 27. 
it says that death is merely a door. Death is merely a door. That when you die, then you now walk through that door. And then accountability begins. Responsibility. Accountability. He's saying, if you walk through that door, death, and you die in the Lord, Jesus carried all your sins on the cross. <sighs> Eternal celebration in heaven. Eternal celebration in the kingdom of God. I'm saying eternal. I don't know that you understood the word eternal. Eternal. And he say, however, if you make a mistake and play with sin like the present day church and the present day generation plus the present day church that is playing with sin. If you make a mistake and play with sin, and by the time you die, you die in your sins, not in the Lord. It is unbelievable to stand before the Lord, before the white throne judgment of God, while you are carrying all your sins. It is just unbelievable. The judgment method there is unbelievable. And yet the opportunity is here. For you to be born again properly and shed your sins. Not to be born again and go pick your sins again. Are we together? This is serious. So the casual Christian life you see in Europe and Africa, casual, is peligroso, very deadly. Mucho, mucho peligroso. Muy, muy peligroso. And then Matthew 25. Matthew 25. I can begin from verse 10. If you want, we can read verses 1 up to, 20, up to 13. But 10 on is good enough for and in a hurry. The Bible says the book of Matthew 25 from verse 10. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. The dangers of living a casual Christian life. These are people in the church that she's talking about. These are people inside the church. They are the foolish virgins. They are inside the church. Read in a hurry, finish. Verse 11. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. 12. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I don't know you. To tell you the truth, I do not know you. A but, casual Christian life says the following. <laughs> A casual Christian life says the following. That if you take the sangre de Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, and you add codicia sexualis, sexual lust, to it is equal to hell. Let me put it better. If you take the light of salvation and you add to it the darkness of the devil, it is always equal to darkness. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Ultimate. There is no higher. And so, if you abuse the blood of Jesus, there is no other sacrifice available for you. Let me just read this in a hurry before she continues with that scripture. Let me read the book of Hebrews says, for favor, Hebreo says, let me read in a hurry. Joel lea rapidamente. Hebreos 6, versículo uh, 4 al 6. He says the following. Hebrews chapter 6, 4 to 6, he says the following. He says, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, he says, It is impossible. If I were you and I meet the word impossible, I underline it. In Spanish, they said, no, es posible. 
Imposible. No es posible. No, it's not possible. So if you meet that, you underline that. Impossible. He says, it is impossible for those who have those who have once been enlightened, those who have tasted the heavenly gift, those who have shared in the Holy Spirit, those who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. And if they fall away, it is impossible for them to be brought back to repentance. Why? Because to their loss, they are crucifying the son of of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Hebrews chapter 10, 26, 31. Hebrews 10, 26, 31. He says, the key word there, deliberamente. He says, if we deliberately Keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth. If you meant deliberately, you underline it. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man or someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God under his foot? Who has treated as an holy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? And who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord said, It's a dreadful thing. Again, and again, and again, the Lord who judges people, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wangeshi, well, you put some water here. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then a third warning is Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, a third warning. In a hurry, put on the table there. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to table is this table here. Second Peter chapter 2, 19 to 22. Disinueve. Secunde Pedro, capítulo 2, versículo 19 al 22, por favor. Second Peter, chapter 2, 19 to 22, says, They promised them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave of whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world, by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then they are again entangled in it and overcome by that same corruption. They are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on them. Of them the Proverbs is true. A dog returns to his vomit. And a pig, a soul that has been washed, returns to wallowing in the mud. Three warnings by the Lord. On the dangers of a casual Christian life. The dangers of living a Christian life normally, just casually, normally. He says it's unbelievable. If you take the grace of Jesus and then abuse the grace of Jesus, 
the way the modern day church is abusing the grace. He says it's unbelievable danger. There is no more sacrifice that can save you. Because the ultimate sacrifice is the blood of Jesus and then you abuse it. And when the Lord Jesus appeared to me in the sky, the first thing he showed me is the nail pierce. Meaning, go and tell them not to forget this. Go and tell them that even if when I look at them, I see as if they are calling for a second Calvary. Even if when I look at them, I see as if they are crying for a second deliverance. Even if when I look at them, I see as if they are saying that the first blood, the first Calvary was not sufficient in power to totally deliver them from sin. However, just run and tell them and say that please, the Lord says, just be born again perfectly with the first Calvary. There is no second Calvary. Because right now, he has defecto. Mucha defecto. Scars and wounds. They abuse. He cannot be accepted as a perfect sacrifice anymore. Even if Jesus himself is looking at the church, even if Jesus himself looks at the church and sees how desperate she is mixed with sin, how desperate her condition is requiring a second Calvary, even if Jesus himself looks at the church and sees that she needs a second deliverance and decides in himself that he wants to go and die for her again, he cannot be accepted. He cannot be accepted to die for the church again. Right now he has defect. He has scars and wounds. The dangers of a casual Christian life. Unbelievable. So you see Jesus warning there. That there are two types of death. You want them to say, you will die in your sins if you fool around. And then Revelation 14, 13 says, there are only two types of death. Either you die in the Lord, or you die where? Or you die in your sins. Let me finish with that Revelation 13, 14, 13 before we move on. And he says something very powerful there. Revelation 14, 13, if you allow me. He says the following. Then I heard a voice from heaven. Senor mismo, Dios mismo dice. Senor spoke. Then I heard a voice from heaven. The Lord spoke. The voice from heaven say, Write, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And remember during this time that the Lord is talking about, at this time there is a slaughter. If you go to verse 7 of the same scripture, verse 7. Verse 7 it says of the same scripture. Hallelujah. There is persecution. There is persecution at this time. Focus on me. Let me contextualize for you this so you understand better this instruction. At this time there is persecution. There is a slaughter. Anybody worshipping Christ there is a slaughter. This is when the Lord, make sure, make sure she's ready to read the scripture there. I don't have time, my chair, take church. Take church. So, that at this time there is persecution, and he's saying, still in that, make sure you die in the Lord than to die in sin. And then he says, why? Why are you blessed when you die in the Lord? Now he has taken death. And blessings and put together. Why has he said so? He says because of the following reason. He said yes. Says the spirit of the Lord. They will rest from their labor. For their deeds will follow them. They will rest from their labor. For their deeds will follow them. My Lord. They were living with Christ. So what is he saying? Focus on me. <laughs> Focus on me blessed people. Let me just explain this. He's saying the salvation of Christ. If you're walking in the right salvation of Christ. 
you must be persecuted. Number two, he's saying it is not, not easy to walk with Jesus in this generation. And that's why in Titus chapter 2, if you read verse 11 to 13, he says to wait for the coming Christ in this age. Meaning, in this age it will not be possible. A rotten age. A sinful age. A wicked generation. He's saying, in other words, it is not easy to serve the Lord in this age. You'll be persecuted. You'll be forsaken. You'll be a used he's saying why are they blessed when they die in the Lord because they will rest from their labor they will rest from persecution they will rest from blackmail they will rest from always running while people want to kill them remember in the times of the great tribulation if you don't have the mark of the beast, it may not be possible to do commerce, to buy or sell. And that is quite ter terrible. But if we go back during the Roman times, during the Roman times, those that were walking with Jesus, it was very hard for them to buy and sell or do business. Why? Because you had to belong to a trade union. You had to belong to a trade union to do commerce. So if they found out that you worship Jesus and you are holy and you refuse to renounce your faith, you could not because you have to enter the trade union to do trade or to have some income. So he's saying that if you are working correct with Jesus today and you get a job as an accountant in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Italy, in USA, in South Korea, wherever. And then they tell you to cook the books for some corruption, for some big money to be taken. If you refuse, they will kick you out. It is not easy to walk with Jesus at this time and to serve him. That's what he's saying. Number two, he's saying that when we are born again, we are called to service. To go and evangelize the streets. To stop every car with a handbill and give. Thank you. Can I talk to you about Jesus? Can I give you this? No, get away. I don't want whatever. Some spit on your face or they pour coffee on your face as they drive away. He's saying there is a persecution in the streets. You knock the door. Kong, kong, kong. Open. What is it? I want, can I come in? Why? I want to talk about, I'm an evangelist. I want to talk about Jesus. Bah! A door. Pastoring. Evangelism. He's saying it's not easy. Luxembourg is sleeping. It's not easy to be a pastor in this age. That's what he's saying. But he's also saying, Hallelujah. That this is the only time to serve Jesus. This is the only time to evangelize Jesus. That when you get to heaven, there will be no evangelizing of Jesus. So he's saying, blessed are those who die, who sleep in the Lord, who die in the Lord. Why? Because he says, number one, they will rest from their labors. No more persecution, abuse, and persecution, whatever. Number two, that their deeds will follow them there. Their deeds will follow them there. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them there. Please focus on me. I mean, for a moment, I know they are Latin languages here. I don't want to slide that way. He's saying the following. That when they were in Egypt, they labored very heavily. And then the Lord brought them 
into God's rest. So they rested from their labor. And he's saying, before you clap, that when Jesus was on the earth here, he labored for the Lord. And the reason he labored is because placed right in front of him was tremendous reward. The promise of the Lord. The promise of glory. And then, that is, read for them the book of, read for them, uh, uh, that is Romans chapter 12, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. If not, I move on. The Bible says, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a, such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him. For the joy set before him. He endured the cross. He endured the cross and the shame. Continue. Scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he's saying that even Jesus, he labored for the Lord. And when he finished, he went into the rest of the Lord. Don't, before you clap, <laughs> even the servants of the Lord, and in this generation, you are privileged, you can see some walking here. They always labor for the Lord and then enter God's rest. Even the Old Testament saints, They labored for the Lord and then entered God's rest. Even Lazarus, the poor man that was with wounds and dogs are leaking. Longing to eat the crumbs that have fallen under the table. Lazarus also labored for the Lord before he entered God's rest with Abraham. With Abraham. And he's saying, for this generation, you want to enter eternity? What labor have you labored for the Lord? For him to allow you to enter, to go now and rest this cancer. This generation of Christians want to enter God's rest without laboring for the Lord? Without persecution? How will that be possible? He said, because their deeds will follow them there. What deeds will follow you there? Everybody loved you in that city? All the members of your church loved you? This is serious. Okay, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 10, real quick. The Bible says, the book of Isaiah chapter 6 verse 10, the Bible says, make the heart of these people calloused and make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. That is serious, blessed people. So now, I want us to finish. So, all of you, Second Samuel chapter, Second Samuel chapter fourteen, verse fourteen. In summary of what we've seen today. The Bible says the book of Second Samuel. Okay, so read it very fast. Chapter fourteen. Verse fourteen. Verse 14, the Bible says, Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that, that is not what God desires. Rather, he, devise, he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. And then Isaiah 53, he comes now 
to remove them from that fall. Isaiah 53, 8 and 9 and so forth. You have read that before. And then in this vision, he presents two types of people, two resurrections. One for heaven, one for damnation. In other words, he's saying there are only two destinations. So the Lord Almighty is asking this church to be born again. The present day church to repent, turn away from sin and be born again proper. As I finish, Jesus always wanted the church to participate in the first resurrection, blessed people. And we have seen the importance of this resurrection as being the foundation of our faith and the hope of our faith. We have seen, if you get a chance, just read one more scripture and then we finish. The book of Acts chapter 17, verse 30, 31, that that resurrection is the one that appointed him to be the judge that is coming. The Bible says, the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. The Bible says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he demands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So resurrection was the most important preaching of all the apostles of Jesus, right? So you also need to go back home and now start preaching only resurrection. And when they hear that, they will now have hope. They will know that we are totally different from the rest of the world. The Muslims, none of their gods was resurrected. The Hindus, none of their god has been resurrected. For us, our God has been resurrected. Read for me Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, 21. And then I want Romans 1, 4 and Luke 24, 46. I want, first of all, real quick, Matthew 16, 21. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So resurrection is the one that reveals the divine nature of God. The divine nature of Jesus as God. Because he defeated death. I'm now summarizing my way out. Resurrection is the greatest miracle of all miracles. Resurrection is also the greatest wonder of all wonders. When they asked him, what sign will you give us? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it. The sign he gave them is resurrection. Hallelujah. I'm now finishing. Resurrection in Matthew 12, 39. The Bible says, the book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. 39. Verse 39, the Bible says, He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Very powerful. That claim, exclusive claim. The book of Acts chapter 13, 28, uh, it's too long a read, I don't know how much you read. He claimed right there, that he will be resurrected. And then we have seen that resurrection is the one that defines the destination of mankind. Heaven. And for those who don't believe, inferno. Resurrection of the Lord is the one that offered the church a perfect model for sacrificial Christian living. 
Because now with that hope, you can undergo anything and sacrifice your lives. I have a lot of scriptures here. I cannot read them because of time. Resurrection is the one that Jesus will use to recompense the earth. Those who have done right and those who have done evil. That is the distinction. That those who have done well, right, holy, will be given that gift of resurrection for glory. And those who have sinned, resurrection for judgment. I'm just walking through as I finish. Resurrection of Jesus is what should instruct our preachings today. Everywhere globally. Resurrection is the greatest promise that God ever gave the church. Thank you for those who are writing. Thank you for those who are writing, not staring at me. Resurrection is the greatest promise that God ever gave the church. I have scripture, but we don't have time, so we cannot read. Resurrection, the gift of resurrection, is the one that teaches the church to live a heavenly focused life. Hallelujah. Resurrection that is promised to the church is the one that teaches the church to ignore the present day life. To ignore. To ignore este vida de este hora. And focus on the coming life. Resurrection of Jesus. I'm simply checking out now. The resurrection of Jesus and the promised resurrection to the church is the one that has come out so plainly and openly to instruct us and teach us and inform us that this world is not our home. Not our home at all. Resurrection. Resurrection is what tells us that as we live here, therefore, because this world is not our home, as we live here, therefore, we now must now plan for our future life while we are here. Hallelujah. Is anybody gaining a word or two? Thank you, Finland, for gaining. <laughs> Very powerful. Resurrection is the one that teaches us to rubbish this life and focus on the heavenly life. Resurrection teaches us that this life, this world is not our home. Help us to live a sacrificial Christian life. Resurrection is the power of the gospel. That's why the apostles of Jesus, they preached resurrection. And that God for had power and that's why the servants of God have come preaching another kingdom, a coming kingdom with power. Yesterday, blind eyes opened here in China. Resurrection is the power of the gospel. Because that makes the gospel superior beyond this world, beyond this life. Resurrection is the power of the gospel. It makes the gospel lift us beyond this earth. Hallelujah. Amen. So, resurrection is the foundation of our salvation. So our salvation therefore is strictly based
then even the promise of resurrection of the saints is going to be fulfilled. Thank, that one you can clap. That's very powerful. I bless you for clapping. That one is very serious. The resurrection of the saints will be fulfilled also. The confirmation, the vindication of Jesus And the validation of Jesus as God was only done by resurrection. Resurrection is what confirms that God will judge. Sin. That God will judge the unrepentant. Repentant, and you will judge them into hell. hell, and at the same time, you will recompense the faith. Resurrection is the word. The reward is the reward for the faithful saints. Their reward is that one. Resurrection. And then they release the they release the wife because the children remain alone. So they say, let's release the wife to take care of the children. And they ask, Are you still going to follow Jesus? And they said, I think you will have to kill me. And they took no, they brought from the jail to an office a panel. Are you still going? You've been there, it's nasty for a long time. Are you still going to follow Jesus? 
He looked at them. He said, I think you'll have to kill me. And they put back. He's sitting here right now. Not one. Maybe three are sitting here today. So this is not a joke. This is serious. The promise of resurrection. What is the point? Renouncing Jesus when you know that you must die. Everybody must die eventually. And then when you die, you now go down. It will be irreconcilable if you renounced Jesus. You will weep all the days of your life. The only few days you add after which you die. But the ones that stood, they go into glory. Hallelujah. So I want to finish with this one here. Daniel was being promised that in the end he will get his lot, his inheritance. We saw yesterday. I don't know how much I can give you because I, I want to move to glorification eventually tomorrow. Tomorrow. I want you to stay here. Now I like it. Now I like it. <laughs> in the beginning I was too tired. I said I cannot make it. <laughs> now I like it. I want you to stay. I want you to stay. I know you are staying only until this weekend. But we will fix it. We will manage everything. Right? The key things I must bring to you in our program is glorification and the pulpit. The heavenly pulpit, the Lord Lord in that vision. I Make sure you don't leave until you hear that. And my daughter has joined us today. I'm very blessed. Masi uh, Kerubo. The Lord bless you indeed. Arrived in the morning and ran here, right? Very powerful. It's good to see you. The Lord Jesus bless you. Thank you so much. So now, this is very serious. Daniel chapter 12. Go up to the end. Go your way up to the end. Don't stop. You, Daniel, you remember when you were still a teenager? You were young and vulnerable. And you remember how you stood strong and refused to give in? And you refused to eat the kingly diet? You also remember when they asked you to worship the king, you refused, and they put you in the lion's den? You, Daniel, go on walking on that way you are way, in which God has been with you. And you have been rejecting the world, separating yourself, and following Jesus. Go on in that way up to the end. Don't branch, don't stop. And at the end, you will rest, and then at the end, you will be resurrected. There is a day, that day, when everything will be made perfect. Okay? I wish I had time to bring that to you. We would have done so much exploits. The end of the days. I don't know how to do it. Maybe just read it for you. But we can go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel, do se por favor. And he says the following. Verse 13. As for you, Daniel, go your way till the end. You will rest and then at the end of the days. What is the meaning of the end of the days? There is a particular day called the end of the days. Go your way. What does it mean go your way? Till the end. You will rest and then at the end of the days you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. What does it mean to receive your allotted inheritance? What is the allotted inheritance? So if we had time, we would have handled all that. But I want us to close it here today. Because the Lord says that time has come for the church to repent. The end of the days is what the Lord refers to at the renewal of all things. At the renewal of all things. Just right now, because we are simply checking out. That is where all the laws and all the prophets have always been pointing humanity to. Okay, let me start that because I see there's need for translation there. The end of the days is the time that the Lord refers to in the Bible as at the renewal of all things. And that is the time to which all the prophets in the Bible, 
always appear and appoint humanity to. At the renewal of all things. What Daniel was called, given, was told the end of the days, at the end of the days. At the end of the days, is called at the renewal of all things. And that is the day, that is the time for which every miracle ever performed in the church, in the Bible. Every miracle ever performed in the Bible and in the church has always been pointing humanity to that time at the renewal of all things, to that day. Every sermon ever preached, I'm talking about the holy sermons of God, right? Because today people preach for money, but I'm talking about that I've heard that, the true sermons of God. Every sermon ever preached since creation until now is always with one purpose, pointing all humanity to that time called at the renewal of all things. Every miracle, every wonder ever performed by the Lord has always had only one purpose, to direct everybody to that day called at the renewal of all things, which Daniel was told at the end of the days. It is also called regeneration, the culmination. It is art regeneration, regeneration, when everything will be made new. Well, when John the Baptist appeared and he talked about the kingdom of God is near, that is what he was pointing at, at the renewal of all things. Are we together? Anybody with me? Thank you, Grace Wu. Thank you, my daughter, Grace Wu. <laughs> you love God too much, I know, I know, I know. Thank you, thank you very much. The Lord bless you indeed. Uh -oh. So even John the Baptist, when Jesus appeared and he said the kingdom of God is near, that is the time he was referring to that is now near. Daniel was told at the end of the days, but it is also called at the renewal of all things. When it was said that the kingdom of God is at hand, that is the period, that is the day that is being referred to in the Bible. All the gospel is meant to point all humanity to that day, that time. I've said all the miracles and the wonders performed, ever performed, point on that day. When Jesus came and died on the cross, he did so for that day. The day of renewal of all things. Are we together now? I'm simply summarizing as we check out. And he's saying here that the Holy Spirit came to the church for one purpose, for that time. To prepare everybody, the whole humanity, for that time called at the renewal of all things. Hallelujah. I said every preaching that was ever done since creation has been pointing humanity to that time. Every baptism that was done in many pools is always preparing people for that day. Hallelujah. Serious. And he's saying that the reason the Bible was ever written Hallelujah. Is that it may prepare humanity for that day. At the renewal of all things. And Daniel was told at the end of the days. The reason many Christians agree to enter martyrdom. To be killed for the gospel. Is because of that day. Hallelujah. That they may die now, but live to see that day at the renewal of all things. That is serious, my daughter from Austria. Very serious. The reason 
the Lord showed Jacob the ladder of Jacob. The reason the Lord lowered the ladder of Jacob was because of that day at the renewal of all things that mankind may connect to that day at the renewal of all things. The reason he that is standing the two prophets of Yahweh that have come and doubled are walking the earth is because of that day that humanity may be prepared for that day at the renewal of all things that you may not miss it hallelujah and the reason the cloud of God come hallelujah <laughs> The reason the cloud of God came realization of these promises and know that there is an invitation by the Father Himself for that day at the renewal of all things. Public invitation by God. God Himself came to invite you that you may enter that day at the renewal of all things. So when he told Daniel, you go your way. In other words, it's Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, 14. Go through the narrow way. In other words, it's Daniel chapter 16, chapter, chapter 3, 16 and 18. Through the flames of fire. In other words, it's Daniel chapter 6, 10 to 16. Through the lion's den. Hebrews chapter 11, read it for us. We have read it already. But if you read verse 16, can anybody just stand up and read verse 16 of Hebrews 11? The better country, the better city. Because of the promise of a better country, a better city. Thank you. Read it loud. Yeah. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That city is at that place. At the renewal of all things. The new Jerusalem. It is at that place. It is there. That's why the Lord sent us to point everybody to there. Just there that place at the renewal of all things and he said because of that time there are for those who are preparing for that place they have accepted to be forsaken with Jesus they have accepted to faithfully follow Jesus they have accepted to be firm on the faith in Jesus they have loved Jesus with all their heart. Why? Because of that day. They have loved him. They have believed in him. They have been persecuted with him. They have suffered with him. They have been abused with him. They have preached him. They have been abandoned by him. They have fought for him also because of that day. Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. And so, I hope that I get a chance to speak to you about the pulpit and about glorification. Otherwise, there's just too much to handle, right? Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Jesus te ama. The Lord loves you very much. We can stop it here today, but I'm saying that surely, surely, that vision of the rapture of the dead is a very powerful vision. I bless you, my daughter who stood up. I bless you, I bless you. The one who stood up, I bless you. I bless you very much. Thank you. She's next to you there, next to you. Thank you. I have blessed you, my daughter. It will be well, right? Thank you. So now, we will continue tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll handle glorification. And I will try to see if I can now handle the pulpit after that. Hallelujah. The Messiah is coming. Do you allow me to have five minutes, 15? Can I do a summary? What?
I need to give you a microphone. Stand up, stand up and shout it. As much time as you want, my father. That's that saith who? That saith who on behalf of who? <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Take the microphone. Give him the microphone. <laughs> if you give me five minutes, I'll just summarize everything for you. Hallelujah. Can you say it? All the time that you need, my fathers and my lords. All Thank the you time so much. To the Lord. I know you love the Lord so much. You really love that day that is coming when you'll see Jesus glorified, right? Yes, my fathers and my I Lord, don't know yes. whether the rest do the same. Are you ready for it? Okay, and then let me make the following summary. Let me summarize for you everything so that we are now on one page. It's always good to do a general summary for everything. We've talked about many things, right? Number one, we have seen that in the book of 1 Thessalonians, the lead scripture about the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians. Yes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm also going there, opening that. The lead scripture about the vision of the rapture of the church. We have seen only the first two verses. Hallelujah. And those verses are 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Verse 14. Now you understand that scripture better. Right? Uh, is, am I right? Verse 14, he says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Only that we have been handling, this blessed hope that is meant, that should transform how you live here. So in a nutshell, this is what you have seen, if you want to write. We have seen that those who die before the rapture, they are not lost. And we have seen that mankind, once the Lord has created you, your life is eternal. And we have seen that there are only two destinations, either to heaven or to hell. And we have seen that this conversation is being directed to the church by the Lord. The conversation of the rapture. So the rapture is exclusively for the church alone. And most importantly, the Holy Church. Holy. Santo. It is directed the Christian community to the believers. And the Lord is saying that he does not want you to be uninformed. In other words, you must become enlightened when you are a Christian. And these are fundamentals. This particular one is fundamental. You must become enlightened on the matter of your entry into the kingdom of God as a Christian. That's the reason you became saved. We have seen that. Thank you, my son Barno, you have come. But we are finishing. Just find a seat. There are seats in front here. There's in front right here. Next to Gero. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down, please. Next to Gero. Next to Gero here. Thank you. So you have come late, but you've not missed a thing. So he says, you brought milk for the guests, right? Thank you so much. Thank you, my son. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord does not want the church to be uninformed, so he wants the church to be enlightened. And that means the believers are required to be fully informed, fully educated, fully aware also about the coming of the Messiah and about the glorious kingdom of God, right? And in so doing, the Lord also wants you to be aware of misinformation, ill information, disinformation, fake news, whatever you want to call it. You must be informed with the right information, not to enter in some theories saying, is it post-rapture, is it mid-tribulation, post-tribulation? No, 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 no. You just must get the right information and prepare properly. That is what is coming out of our conversation until now. He's saying that getting to know about death and resurrection 
and even getting to know about the rapture is the most important foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. Because when we are born again, we must be born again to prepare for the kingdom of God. So that is a basic foundational doctrine in Christianity. Foundational message. The foundation of our faith is that death and resurrection. Without resurrection, you would be preaching lies. If Jesus did not resurrect, you would have no hope. No esperanza. If he is not resurrected. So, resurrection of Jesus and the promised resurrection of the church is the foundation of the Christian faith. So, you must know it. And the aspects you must know is the following. Death. As a Christian, you must be informed about death. What happens at death? What is the importance of death? What is the significance of death within God's program? Program for deliverance. And we have seen, for example, Hebrews chapter 9, 27, that death is simply a door. A door to the eternal realm. And you prepare for that realm from this side. Right now here. You don't prepare elsewhere. After death is too late. So you must be aware about death. Hallelujah. And it says, you must also be aware about resurrection as we saw. And you must be aware about Christ's return. The coming of the Messiah. When he said you must be informed, you cannot be uninformed, this is what he meant. He meant that you must be prepared and aware. You must be aware about the rapture so you can prepare the return of the Christ. You must also be very much aware about the role of holiness and righteousness in that program of the Lord. That if the Bible says for without holiness nobody will see the Lord, then you must just prepare appropriately. Then you must now center you are preaching or your Christian life on what matters most. The holiness of the Lord in the church. The righteousness of the Lord in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. He's saying that therefore you must also be aware about purity. Because holiness and righteousness go with purity of the believer. And when you do that, you must be aware about the role of the church in this program of God. When he says he's coming to take the church, you must be aware that in your holiness and righteousness, you have the duty, responsibility to shine the light of Christ to the dark world and win them also to this program of God that they may not go to hell. And that when he said you must be informed, and aware. And it's not a good thing for you to be uninformed or ignorant. He also meant that you must know so much about the value and the power and the role of the blood of Jesus. The value and the power and the role of the cross of Jesus. Hallelujah. And the Lord says that therefore in his scripture, he calls death falling asleep. Those who have fallen asleep. Read for me Isaiah chapter 19, 20, no, chapter 26, 19, 21 in a hurry. Just a few scriptures for you in the summary, please, if you allow me. Is somebody still, do you still like me? I would be very sad. It would be the saddest day if you, if you people, I like Grace who's saying, please rise up, we can lie. <laughs> Rise up so we like him. <laughs> Thank you so much, Grace Wu. <laughs> but this is very important. Can you write down the following scriptures? The book of Isaiah chapter 26 verses 19 to 21. Read in a hurry. The Bible says, Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19 to 21. But your dead will live, Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. The other version said those who sleep in the dust. So death is called sleep. I'm just touching on a few things we have seen as I summarize out. And then if you read Daniel chapter 12, again 2 and 3, we have seen the same. Those who sleep, the multitudes who sleep, we have seen death being referred to as sleep. Why? Because their body will be awoken. The soul is always alive. So don't say, oh, if I die, 
go, I'll be forgotten. I'll just drift away. Not at all. He will bring you to account. And he said, you must be informed about that so you can live with wisdom in this age. Hallelujah. Daniel chapter 12 verse Okay, Hebrews chapter 9, 27 we have read also. And then 2 Samuel chapter 14, chapter 14 verse 14 we read. Job chapter 10 verse 8 we didn't read maybe. Just read Romans. Job 8, 10, 8. Read Romans 14 verse 8 is better probably. Romans 14, 8. For the Christians. The Bible says, Romans chapter 14 verse 8, if we live, we live for the Lord. Yes. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Yes, that's now the Christians. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Hallelujah. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And we've seen also John chapter 11, verses 11, 26, when he says, for the, if anyone believes, he will not die. Or if anyone believes, whether he dies, he will live right very important there's a whole battery a whole domain of information he expected you to know when he said it is not good for you to be uninformed about a central matter like your faith like the coming of the messiah like your entry into glory right so when the non-christians die what is the difference we have seen for you, when you die, you are united with Christ. But when the non-Christians die, they are separated from the Lord. Thank you for writing that. They are separated from the Lord. For them, death is a separation from God. Can you read Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 9? I'm simply summarizing if you allow me. The it, Bible says, Second Thessalonians Chapter 1, 7 and 9. Chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, the Bible says, And give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. Verse 8, he will punish those who do not know God. He will punish those who do not know God. And do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And do not obey the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus. Verse 9. Verse 9. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. I and think that is where there is a misconception. Can you just allow me to talk to people? That is where some highly schooled people in theology get a misconception and a false doctrine. And that's why the Lord said it's very seriously important that you are fully enlightened. Meaning, enlightened meaning you are well educated on the right information, the exact information, the correct information, and you place yourself at a place where you will tap, you will always receive the right teachings, the right information about the coming of the Messiah, your Christian faith, eternity, right? So he's saying, will be punished with everlasting destruction. People thought that that means there will be destruction. You'll be destroyed. So, so there you go. So you, it will not matter now. You'll be destroyed. So nothing will matter when you're destroyed. So they think that anyhow, you'll be destroyed. But that everlasting destruction, sometimes other scriptures call it eternal death. That is, those are simply words for eternal punishment. Eternal judgment. So don't be mistaken and think that it, you'll be destroyed. Eternal destruction, you'll be destroyed. In any case, you won't feel anything. No, 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 no. No. Even the glorious body you get will be a body that is designed to perceive pain and punishment and judgment. So, hallelujah. So just finish up if you did not. If you did not. And shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. That is serious to be glorified among his people. If you get time to read the book of Romans chapter 8, he's talk about the whole creation is waiting for when the sons of God, sons and daughters, sons and sons and daughters of God will be revealed. And there is a groaning that is taking place, meaning we too need to be anxious, anxiety waiting for the Messiah. 
ansiosamente. Because there is a groaning by the Holy Spirit himself. The groaning by mankind not knowing how to pray. The groaning by creation. There are three groanings as people wait for that day. The day of glorification. The day of rapture. When finally the world will know who exactly were the sons and daughters of God. Because right now if you ask them, everybody says they are son and daughter of God. But the true day of the truth is coming. That's why I always tell people, please repent. Just repent all the time before that day, right? And so, so you finished, right? Very good. So what you have said, it is the responsibility of the Christian believer to always find the right place, the right church, where they can access the right information about the coming of the Messiah. So you are not in a place where someone will tell you that, no, when the Messiah comes, only the bad people will be removed. No. He comes to take his church into glory. Hallelujah. Forget about the events of the second coming, when the bad people will be removed, so that he, the, the right ones enter into his millennial kingdom. But for now, you must prepare for departure. Everything I've been saying in those visions, they are simply talk about departure, departure, departure. Hallelujah. Departure this time. So we are finishing. The hope again that you do not mourn as those without hope can we run through the hope number one titus chapter one verse two in a hurry you will help me now you can stand there now you can stand i have a lot of scriptures let's look at that hope that he says you should anchor on so you don't fear death so if somebody threatens you with death you simply focus on the hope can you read titus one two real hurry the bible says the book of titus chapter one verse two in the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Promised much earlier. That hope is saying that you have, and the none born again don't have, was promised before creation of time. And it says in Titus 2, 11, 14, please. The Bible says, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, mm -hmm. for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to, to all, all people. Mm -hmm. It teaches us to... To all people. Did you hear the word All. The Lord is saying he is making a public invitation to all mankind. Hell was never meant for man. Hell was never meant for mankind. The Lord is making a public invitation to all the 8 billion human beings. 8 billion to come and enter his kingdom. That is just how powerful our God is, right? To all people, the salvation, the grace of God. In but, a hurry, if not, I read it. Verse 12. Verse 11, Nehari. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Look at that. He's talking about the self-sufficiency of the grace. The grace has power to coach you and train you and teach you and nurture you. In doing what? In saying no. To say no to ungodliness mm -hmm. and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present The dichotomy age. is the following. That the grace is self-equipped with the authority and the instruction to sensitize you on what is evil and sinful. To say no to godlessness. Pole, 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 pole. Just slowly. Very good. Help him so you don't fall. Thank you. That the grace of God has appeared that teaches you to say no to godlessness. You let a nurse follow. Yes, thank you. But he's going to be alright. Yes, thank you. So he's saying that the grace of God has appeared which has enough power to teach you to identify evil and reject it. And then to identify godliness, holiness, righteousness, and receive it. Next. Verse 13. While we wait for the blessed hope. So he calls the rapture of the church the blessed hope. If you read, I don't have the, time. The appearing of the glory of our great God and the Savior. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. So he's... Jesus Christ. He says Jesus is God which is very powerful. But that appearing is essentially the rapture. The coming of the Messiah. 
That is what you see in John chapter 14, verses 1 to verse 3. And you see it also in second in first Corinthians rather, chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. And you see it also in First Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. You see it also uh, mentioned in Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. You see it mentioned many other scriptures. You see it mentioned in uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses uh, chapter 5, 1 to 10, chapter 1, also 9 and 10, where he's saying the church is exempted from tribulation, that the Lord comes to rescue you from coming wrath. That is what he refers to there as the blessed hope. So then that is the hope he was saying that once you have, you should live totally different from the unborn again. Because for you now, you're waiting for the Messiah. You have hope. And if there's a funeral, you don't moan like this. What shall I do? What have you done to us? Is that really you lying there? Oui, oui, oui. No, you don't do that. You simply celebrate a life well lived. If you are in the right church, right? That's why it's important and your responsibility to find the right church. Hallelujah. Let's move on very fast. Uh, the book of Revelation chapter 3, 7 to 13, that we know very well. That blessed hope is that church that he blessed. The church in Philadelphia, he opened the door for them. He gave them all this loving of God. He used the key of David to open for them a door into glory. That is the blessed hope he talked about. And remember, that is at a time when the door was closed in Genesis 3.24, right? And so, he's saying the following also. Uh, Genesis 3.21, the first blood, when the first blood was poured, the worshipping of the blood appeared. The Bible says, Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, the Bible says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And then Genesis 5.24, when uh, Enoch was raptured, that is the blessed hope he was pointing you to. And then Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, for example, the that is the blessed hope he talked about. Genesis 22, when now Isaac was not slaughtered and the ram appeared, that is the blessed hope he's talking about, right? I'm just running through because of time. Time is not on our side. And we've seen also Isaiah 53, that is the blessed hope he talked about. And 1 Corinthians 15, 50 that I've mentioned. Romans chapter, 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the hope he said you have. And the book of Numbers 23, 19, read it. Number, the Bible says, the book of... Numbers 23, 19, please. Numbers 23, 19, the Bible says... The Bible says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Yes, so that you have that hope, he will fulfill it. If he has fulfilled the first one with Christ, he will fulfill it with you also. And that's very powerful. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 3, that hope. So this hope is available. Ecclesiastes 11 3, read in a hurry. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 3, the Bible says, If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. That is serious. And then three, I will, I will explain together. And then Romans, I mean Ecclesiastes 3.11. We have read 11.3, 3.11, then I will explain together. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set, he has e also set eternity. eternity in the hearts of men. So he's saying in Romans chapter 11 verse 3, that when the clouds are full of rain, by, gra by gravity, they're going to pour the rain. And he's saying that when a tree is standing, depending on its content, on its content, it will fall either south or north. But where it falls, there it must lie forever. Hi, that is serious. That means you can only change your eternity now. You cannot change your eternity when death has failed you. And based on what you are will determine which side you'll fall. Those who are righteous, they'll fall towards the 
I don't want to say north <laughs> because the people in the south will slaughter me. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you are right, yes, you'll fall north, right? They say, no, you're, that's politically incorrect, right? But I'm saying if you're holy and righteous, because the Bible says heaven is towards the north, right? You all know that. I'll preach that to someone, right? Yes, so, <laughs> amen. He's saying, if you're righteous and holy, you'll fall towards heaven. And there you stay forever. If you are unholy and with your sins, you'll fall towards hell. And he's saying, because of that, you must now take the time before you die, your life here, to prepare for eternity now. In other words, you must prepare for death. Have you ever prepared for death? Because every day, you know, you live your life as though you will not die. When you hear people have died, you are like, that's them. It's as if it's not you far away. But have you ever noticed that the Lord is simply preparing you for death? How about if you just come out through the door, a vehicle hit you and you die? The Lord is telling you as a generation, we go back to your countries and prepare your nations for death. That they may die in the right condition. Hallelujah. And he's saying in, in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that he has placed eternity in the hearts of men. Look, he created man and then he did this in the nostrils. He put life, the life of God into man. So, mankind is made of earth and heaven. God put a bit of heaven in you. So you are both earth which stays here until the day of redemption when you die and you are soul man became a living being a living soul then a soul which is the lord's hallelujah so he's saying that he has placed eternity in the hearts of men look at this now everybody focus on me now if god has placed eternity in the hearts of men if god has placed eternity in the hearts of all people Look at this now. That means the Lord says the following. That this generation are liars. When they say that we are the atheist association of Europe. The atheist atheista, atheist association of Kenya. They are lying. He's saying everybody is created with capacity to know that God has put eternity in their hearts. And number two, God knows that which if he presents to you, that chip, a chip, a chip, that chip about eternity which he put in your heart should be able to receive. When a transmitter comes, he can receive things of eternity. Can, oh, receive. Can keep receiving the signals of eternity and choose eternity. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you have a receiver, what you do, you give the soldiers receivers when they go to the battle. And then you remain with the transmitter. So when they're in the battle at night, you can, you can, they will receive. You can tell where they are. And they can tell where you are. That our master is signaling us. That is in the world here. He's saying he has placed eternity in the hearts of all people. Meaning, he knows that which, if he presents to you, you can get the signal that now God is calling me for eternity. If he presents a cripple that has walked, then you know. If he presents blind eyes open in China, then you can detect. You are able to respond to eternity. The Lord is saying that everybody is able to respond to eternity in heaven. Hallelujah. I wish our TV, I wish Randy was here. TVs would be working here and things. It's amazing that Randy is not around. Aye. And so, that is serious. And so, we are simply summarizing what we've seen until now. We've seen that Genesis chapter 3.19 is on. Genesis 3.19 is on. The Bible says, the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you will return and then we have seen also very clearly that 
he is talking about second corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 i know verse 8 is good but verse 10 the bible says the book of second corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 the bible says for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body whether good or bad Hi. for the things done while in the body you have to be careful what you do when you're on this earth right and then he says hebrews 10 27 in a hurry what we have seen until now the Hallelujah. bible says the book of hebrews chapter 10 verse 27 the bible says just but read it just read it but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of god that you can leave this earth as a friend of god a child of god or the enemy of god and we have also seen that you can actually be born again and then become an enemy of god that is what the scripture says there are those that were removed out but he turned around the wilderness killed them all hallelujah that is the nature of the God we serve. Hallelujah. And uh, well, uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, and then I'll be able now to summarize. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, and then I'll read maybe one more, and then i summarize this, this part. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, the Bible says, and the dust returns to the ground. It and came the from. dust returns to the ground. It came from. Where it came from. That is what verses 13 and 14 of 1 Thessalonians have been saying here. That we need to prepare for death. The dust returns to the ground. It came from. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. God who gave it. So you must prepare because of that. Then just quickly, First Thessalonians 5.10. I don't have much time really. We don't have time. The Bible says, the book of First Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 10. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. And then if you go to verse 1 of First Thessalonians, even more important, because around there you hear him saying that many will be saying peace, 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 and then all of a sudden, so then that is clear if many will be saying peace 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 and then suddenly the rapture takes place and then of course judgment comes then that can only tell you that the rapture can never happen in the middle of the tribulation which peace 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 would you be saying in the middle of the tribulation so that tells you very clearly it is a pre-tribulation rapture for me i know because i've seen it even the way he has arranged the wedding rings first and then the white horse but the point that people, some will be saying peace, 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 then destruction comes. Which peace, peace, peace would you be saying in the middle of the tribulation? And when you hear that at the last trumpet, it is not one of the seven trumpets. It is not. Not at all. It is not the trumpet judgments. This is a particular trumpet of the Lord. I have heard it, how it sounds. It sounds pa 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 this is a different sound calling them, the Lord summoning his people to come and worship, to appear before him, right? It's not for judgment. So anyhow, let me summarize the following now. Again, one of the key things I don't want to forget is verse 24. He said, be careful that you don't die in your sins. Again, that has to be highlighted. John 8, 24, be careful you don't die in your sins. And that we saw. And then we saw Revelation 14, 13. That there are only two ways you can die. Die in the Lord or die in your sins. And you are being urged to surrender your lives to Jesus and accept the punishment he took on your behalf that you may die in the Lord. Because the difference, the, the people are the same. When you're here, they're the same. Another person next to you are the same. But one dying in the Lord, the other one dying in the sin. The contrast when you cross that door of death is unbelievable. The difference is unbelievable. It will be eternal fire. You cannot breathe. You are in the legs. Of... You cannot eternally. While others are celebrating up there. They are asking, can you imagine so-and-so did not make it? 
what is that you are enjoying? No, I'm just enjoying a nice cuisine. I got it from the third. The third and let me also get some. They're enjoying violin worship. They're worshiping the Lord. They're having banquets and ceremonies and enjoying cuisines. If the cuisines of the earth can be this delicious, how much heaven? If it took the Lord, if it took the Lord only six days to make this earth, sometimes when you look at the mountains, the valleys, the water, the oceans, the rivers, you are shocked, the sky. How much more? Now that he has taken 2,000 years. How much more magnificent is the new Jerusalem? Right? So you need to put that into consideration. Then it will help you. So this is what we have seen in verses 13 and 14. That death is unavoidable. Number one, we have seen that death is totally unavoidable. In other words, we have seen that death is an appointment. That each one is appointed to death. Hallelujah. And the only exception are two. But one of the two has seen the death now in Jerusalem. So death is an appointment. Death is unavoidable. So you rather start preparing for death. They say, oh no, but why are you preaching about death? Me, I don't like a church where they are preaching death. The Bible says... You rather go and spend some time in a funeral than in a wedding party enjoying cakes and rice. You, ra <laughs> you rather go and spend some time in a funeral you, and you look at that casket, that dead body, and you look at it, even if you don't know him or her. But one time, at one moment, it might tell you, hey, how about if that is me? Yeah then it might cause you to prepare. Hallelujah. So go and preach, prepare your nations for death. Hallelujah. All mankind must experience death. That is what we have seen. We have also seen that when you are living on the earth here, you live only once. So please use it, utilize it to prepare for eternity. That's what we have seen. Yvonne, I hope you're writing, my daughter. Powerful you are. So, we have seen that you live on this earth only once. Use it. The other thing we have seen is that life on this earth is much, much shorter than eternity. So, you rather use it preparing for eternity. We have also seen that when you live on this earth, you cannot live as a free spirit who has, does not submit under any God. When you die, you must give accountability to God, whether you are born again or not. We have also seen that when you are living on this earth, on a daily basis, whether you are serving God, evangelizing, being holy or not, you are always in one way preparing for eternity. Whether you like it or not, on a daily basis when you wake up, you are always busy preparing for eternity. Every day when you wake up, you are always busy preparing for eternity. You like it or not. So, you'd rather just be very deliberate and intentional and just prepare well for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The other thing we have seen is that we are exiles on this earth. Meaning one day we will depart this earth. Nosotros extranjeros on this earth. This world is not our home. This is very serious. The book of First Peter chapter 2, 12, 11, 11, 12. Try to read, I see. The Bible says, First Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. The Bible says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires, mm -hmm. which wage war against your soul. Which wage, look at this now. Everybody focus on me. To abstain from sinful desires of the flesh which are waging war against your soul. Look at this now. Your soul is in a battle 
against the sinful desires of the flesh sexual lasting at women sexual lasting at men sexual whatever these things the, the lasting going on the sin look at this now the, 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 they are waging war against your soul right but the present day church has loved them and received those sinful desires so those desires are winning the war they are winning the war against your soul because the, the, you, the Christian, has collaborated with them, has not fought them to help the soul, which is fighting. In so doing, the sinful desires, the devil is winning the souls. They are waging war against your soul. James chapter 4, read very first, 13, 17. James chapter 4, 13, 17. Santiago, capítulo 4, versículo 13, al 17. James chapter 4, verses 13 to 14. The Bible says, James chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. Now listen. To 17, please. To 17. 13, the Bible says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Verse 14. Why? You do not know the, what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. 14. Instead, you ought to say, if it is in the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Verse 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Very serious. So in other words, we have seen that death is not the end of your life. Death is not the end of your life. Death is simply a door. After death, now comes the judgment of God. That's what we have seen until today, since we began this. And that's why we are saying Christians must consider death as sleep. Okay? And then, those who receive Jesus, the inheritance in heaven comes after death. So it's very important to be well informed on that, right? So God is saying that those who die before the rapture when you are mourning them or grieving or in a funeral of those people, you should be aware that the resurrection of Christ nullified the terror of death. The terrorism of death was nullified by the resurrection of Christ. So we have hope. He's saying, like we have seen that there are only two types of funerals on the earth for the born again and born again. For Christians, it's a celebration of a life well lived. You can mourn, you can weep, it's okay, but not as the other people. And the purpose is to make sure that Christians live a totally different life on this earth from the unbelievers. Because Christians have hope beyond this earth. Okay, some people say the tombs, which is true. Beyond the tombs. And so, death is defeated by Christ at resurrection. We have seen that. We have read all the scriptures involved. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And that belief is the bedrock of our faith, right? And there's many scriptures, we may not read them now. Just read Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 11. Second the, Timothy chapter 1 verse 11. The Bible says, Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 11. The Bible says, For us Christians, Jesus defeated death. That's what we are reading. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. Okay, Isaiah 25 8 we saw. Already Hosea 13 14 we saw. Jesus defeated death, right? And how about Revelation chapter 20? 
Do you have verse 14? Or you can read 11 to 15, but verse 14. There is, a, there is a book of deeds. There is a book of deeds. That's what I want to raise there. The I, know, says, I know you live in a generation that highlights grace, which is true, and the faith. You become saved by faith. It is true. But it looks like, much more importantly, for entry, the Lord considers that someone born again proper, that faith should produce forth good deeds. Good meaning holy. Good deeds. So if you are always lasting at people with your eyes, you need to repent on that also. Because that's not a good deed. Or saying white lies, white lies, that's also not a good deed. Hallelujah. This is very serious. We believe that Christ died and rose again. We have hope. Even though we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Right? Do you want to mention sacrificial living? We have seen that, right? So, thank you very much. The Lord bless you. We'll see you tomorrow again. We love you, the love of Christ. Hallelujah. We are clapping to Jesus. So let us just pray. Let us just pray right now for everybody to have a chance to enter, to, to receive Jesus. It's always good to receive Jesus when the door is still open. Say, mighty Lord Jesus, I ask you, my Father, to establish my heart on the kingdom of God. And I repent of all my sins. And I ask you, my Lord Jesus, to give me fire that I may go and prepare my nation for the glorious coming of the Messiah. Precious Lord Jesus, give me zero tolerance to sin and anoint me with the Holy Spirit that I may prepare a holy church for the kingdom of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I am born again. Amen. I blessed you all with the blessings of our Lord Jesus. I blessed you all in the mighty name of Jesus. I don't know why no instrument or no what. Randy is not a, I didn't know Eugene is such a roro. Why didn't Randy come today? Why didn't